Good morning. Welcome to day two of the California Privacy Protection Agency's May 2022 pre-hearing rulemaking sessions. My name is Brian Soublay and I'm the Acting General Counsel for the agency. Please note that this event is being recorded. We're delighted to have so many stakeholders sign up. This event, the stakeholder sessions, is the agency's third pre-rulemaking pre activity. While subcommittees of the board provided input to previous activities, the process has now been turned over to the staff who have organized the stakeholder sessions to further inform the rulemaking process. I have some logistical announcements and I will go over the plan for this session. First, let me sketch the format of these stakeholder sessions so everyone has a sense of how things will proceed. As you can see from the program and schedule, which you can find on the meeting and event page of our website, we are holding a series of stakeholder sessions this week, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, May 6th. During the sessions, we will be hearing from stakeholders on a series of topics that are potentially relevant to the upcoming rulemaking. Those who signed up to speak in advance were generally given a speaking slot for their first choice topic, which will be limited to seven minutes. We will proceed through the program according to the schedule provided on the website. Please note, that all times are approximate and topics may start earlier or later than estimated. You are welcome to come and go from the Zoom conference as you'd like. But if you have an assigned topic, we recommend that you make sure you are signed in before your topic session begins. Even if you did not sign up in advance, you will have an opportunity to speak during the time set aside for general public comment at the end of each day. Please take a moment to review the schedule to see when the public comment is expected to occur. And again, please note that the times are approximate. Each speaker making general public comments will be limited to only three minutes. We will, we will strictly keep time for all speakers in order to accommodate as many stakeholders as possible. Speakers that are scheduled for the current session should be signed up into the public Zoom link using the name or the pseudonym an email that they provided when they signed up to request their speaking slot. If you are participating by phone, you will already have provided the phone number that you'll be calling from so that we may call on you during your pre-appointed speaking slot. Note that your name and phone number may be visible during the public uh, session and in the sub subsequent recording. Speakers will be called in alphabetical order by last name during this window and we will not be able to wait if you miss your slide. When it is your turn, our moderator will call your name and invite you to speak. If you hear your name, please raise your hand when your name is called using the raise your hand function, which can be found in the reaction feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our moderator will then invite you to unmute yourself and invite you to turn on your camera if you wish. You will have seven minutes to provide your comments. In order to accommodate everyone, we will be strictly keeping time and speaking for shorter than the length of time is just fine. When your comment is completed, the moderator will mute you. Please plan to focus your remarks on your main topic. However, if you'd like to say something about other topics of interest at the end of your remarks, you are welcome to do so. You're also welcome to raise your hand during the portion at the end of the day set aside for general public comment. Finally, you may also send us your comments via physical mail or email them to regulations at cppa.ca.gov by Friday, May 6th at 6 p.m. California law requires that the CPPA refrain from using its prestige or influence to endorse or recommend any specific product or service. Consequently, during your presentation, we ask that you also refrain from recommending or endorse, endorsing any specific product or service. I, I now ask that stakeholders who have been assigned the topic of data minimization and purpose limitations to be ready to present. Please use the raise your hand function in Zoom when your name is called so that our moderator can see you easily. As noted, the moderator will call you in alphabetical order by last name. We will now move to the comments on the topic of data minimization and purpose limitations. Ms. Hurtado. Could you please call the first speaker? Yes, good morning. Uh, our first speaker today will be Stacy Gray. Stacy Gray, can you raise your hand, please? Thank you.
Ms. Gray, you have seven minutes. Your time starts now. Thank you so much. Good morning. Thanks. Thank you to the agency for the time today. My name is Stacy Gray, and I'm the Director of Legislative Research and Analysis at the Future of Privacy Forum. FPF is a global nonprofit that focuses on consumer privacy and law, um, with a particular focus on emerging technologies. We work with chief privacy officers of companies across all sectors, as well as scholars, academics, advocates, and policymakers to help drive consensus around principled business practices for emerging tech. Um, I'm here today this morning to offer a few thoughts on the principle of purpose limitation. The California Privacy Rights Act requires businesses to disclose the purposes for which the PI they collect will be used and prohibits them from collecting additional categories of information or using the personal information collected for additional purposes that are, quote, incompatible with the disclosed purpose for which the information was collected without additional notice. That's from 1798-100. As a general business obligation, this reflects the principle of purpose limitation in the fair information practices. So <clears throat> I'll keep this brief. My testimony today is intended to first simply encourage the agency to engage in rulemaking on this issue uh, to the extent that it can devote resources to it. And secondly, to offer a few recommendations on what might be considered a compatible versus incompatible business practice. <clears throat> so first, under Section 185, the agency has a general mandate to issue regulations with respect to defining business purposes for which covered entities may use PI consistent with expectations. We'd encourage the agency to specifically exercise this authority to provide guidance on what is considered incompatible under 1798.100A1. Uh, so why? Purpose limitation is a fundamental principle of the fair information practices. It protects individual and society, uh, societal privacy interests um, without relying on individual consent management. Uh, so that's a key, key thing. It protects against a, a core type of privacy violation, which is covered entities collecting data for one purpose, using it for a very different one. Um, we've seen numerous examples of such violations in recent years, some of them enforced by the FTC as the amount of data available from consumer devices has grown. For example, an individual may consent to sharing precise persistent location information with an app or a service in order to obtain a specific consumer product or service like a weather alert, unaware that that data might be later sold and shared for very different incompatible purposes, such as anything from simple monetization to sharing with law enforcement. Um, given the importance of this principle, the agency should ensure not only that it's respected by covered entities, but also consider providing robust guidance on, uh, on it uh, for the purposes of clarity for both consumers and businesses. Incompatible secondary uses of information should be interpreted strictly. Um, they should include those not reasonably expected by the average person. For example, invasive kinds of advertising profiling unrelated to providing the product or service requested by the consumer, training high-risk algorithmic systems such as facial recognition, or voluntary sharing with law enforcement. At the same time, the agency should consider publishing guidance and clarity for businesses on what might be considered a compatible secondary use of information. Um, some secondary uses of information can include scientific, historical, or archival research that is in the public interest. When subjected to appropriate privacy and security safeguards, um, this kind of secondary use of information, which may or may not be contemplated at the point of collection, um, can lead to true social benefits such as public health tracking. Many companies can and do successfully partner with academic institutions to share information for purposes of conducting such research. Um, it's often on limited or modified data sets and under contractual limitations, sometimes under IRB oversight from an affiliated institution. Um, there are many reasons companies may be cautious about this, and one of those might be you know, not understanding what is considered an incompatible use. But in addition to trust, reputational risk, um, companies are navigating complex legal and policy questions related to this, 
type of secondary use. So uh, I, will, I will stop there and just encourage the agency to consider uh, scientific, historical, and archival research that is in the public interest to be considered a compatible secondary use of information, in addition to um, providing case studies for businesses and consumers and interpreting the provisions strictly to ensure that this very important principle of the fair information practices is respected. Um, so thank you for your time. Happy to follow up further with additional resources. Um, and, and I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. Uh, the next commenter will be Eric Null. Eric Null, please raise your hand. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Null, you may use your camera if you wish. Your time, seven minutes, starts now. Thank you. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak to you today on data minimization and use or purpose limitations. Uh, I'm Eric Null. I'm the director of privacy, the Privacy and Data Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology, which is a DC-based nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that is committed to protecting privacy <clears throat> as a fundamental human and civil right. Data minimization and purpose limitations are critical data protection principles that are often overlooked and not taken very seriously in the US. Many businesses set their own data agendas, crafting essentially limitless practices in dense privacy policies, <clears throat> and businesses often don't think critically about their data practices, nor try to limit the potential data-related harm that they can cause. Data is a commodity prone to overcollection. A survey of industry leaders in the US showed that 36% of them believe that over three quarters of their data is dark, which is essentially unused data, and, and sometimes it's not even known that they have it. And 63% of them believe that over 50% of their data is dark. <clears throat> a recently leaked document from Facebook shows that the company has no idea where all of its user, user data goes and what it's doing with it, uh, which, may, which would make it seemingly difficult to comply with the EU's general data protection regulations own data minimization and purpose limit requirements. <clears throat> And one broader EU study showed that 72% uh, of companies collected data that they didn't end up using. Anecdotal examples of overcollection exists as well. Mobile apps like Angry Birds and the infamous Brightest Flashlight app have had a history of collecting location data without a legitimate purpose. Data brokers who exist in significant part because of data overcollection and retention have in particular capitalized on this trend. Just this week, we saw reports of a data broker selling location data of people who visited Planned Parenthood clinics, uh, that the broker, the broker had been collecting that information using software development kits from various mobile apps that track location for who knows what reason. We also learned today that one data broker made that same location data available for free. And several years ago, mobile carriers were caught providing cell site location data to third party data, broker, data brokers that ended up in the hands of bounty hunters. <clears throat> For their part, people don't want companies to collect such extensive data about them. A 2020 survey showed that almost 80% of Americans expressed concern over sharing personal information with online businesses. And in 2019, a significant majority of Pew survey respondents were concerned about how much data about them is collected by businesses and similar numbers believe the risks to such of such data, uh, data collection outweigh the benefits. Data minimization and purpose limitations are potential solutions to these problems. At its strictest, the minimization principle requires companies to collect only the data they need to provide the product or service and nothing else. But many definitions like California's are broader and tie minimization to specific purposes or uses. These are important substantive provisions in the CPRA and uh, I encourage your agency to engage meaningfully with the plethora of uses for which companies collect data and decide whether there are harmful uses that require uh, curtailing or limiting. One approach taken by my organization, CDT, in its comprehensive privacy framework a couple years ago uh, was to prohibit certain harmful data practices when those practices are, were not required to provide or do not add to the functionality of a product, service, or specific feature that a person has requested. <clears throat> those practices include biometric tracking, precise location tracking, cross-device tracking, tracking of children under 13 years of age, 
uh, collecting the content of or parties to communications, audio and visual recording, uh, or and health information. These uses, when employed beyond the functionality of the product or service, can cause harm without countervailing benefits, and they should be limited. In addition to that list, uh, I would encourage your agency to uh, clarify and limit secondary data use. Uh, as Ms. Gray mentioned, the CPRA states that companies can collect data that is uh, reasonably necessary and proportionate to achieve the original purpose of the collection or another disclosed purpose that is compatible with the context in which <clears throat> the personal information was collected. This language makes clear that uh, the importance of disclosing essentially all uses and it disallows many secondary uses already and then any additional secondary uses are limited to only those that are compatible with the context of the original collection meaning there must be some direct connection between the secondary purpose and the original purpose so for instance if a business collects a person's phone number for account verification purposes it could not then then later use that data to serve ads because that is a wholly different context and would be incompatible with the original collection uh, I would encourage your agency to also limit discriminatory data use. We know that data can be used to discriminate both directly and through algorithmic discrimination. Years ago, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development sued Facebook for letting housing advertisers filter out, uh, filter out ad, ad users on the basis of their race, color, religion, sex, familial status, nationality, or disability. Um, Amazon previously used an HR recruiting tool that downgraded women on the basis of their gender because Amazon's training set for the software included resumes from mostly men. Under no circumstances should companies be allowed to use data or train algorithms in ways that discriminate against people based on protected characteristics, particularly in housing, credit, employment, insurance, and education. <clears throat> uh, and I'll say one final note on the form. We all know that Privacy policies are poor vehicles for informing people about actual data practices. People don't read them, they're too long and difficult to read, and even those who do read them will find a confusing laundry list of practices a business may, quote unquote, may engage in. And without, so without describing actual practices, it's almost impossible to understand what data businesses have about people and how it is used. Uh, the agency should clarify that businesses should create easy to read summaries that describe the most salient data practices that businesses actually engage in. And with that, I thank you for the chance to speak to you today and I look forward to working with the agency. Thank you, Mr. Null for your comment. Our next speaker is Sophie Stella Ordillion. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Stella Bordillion, your time starts now. You have seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I am Sophie Stella Bordillion, uh, Senior Privacy Counsel at Immuta, which is a software company offering data governance tools and privacy enhancing technologies, and Professor in IT Law and Data Governance at the University of Southampton, UK. Um, so a few thoughts on purpose limitation and data minimization. These have been criticized for being antithetic to data-driven business models, such as those based upon profiling, personalization, and automated decision-making. And arguments against purpose limitation and data minimization state that it's not possible, it's not even desirable to pursue data minimization, in particular in the context of data analytics, machine learning, and AI, in particular if one is serious about innovation. That said, the principle have been reaffirmed within leading standards, such as the GDPR, and are emerging in US state law uh, with uh, CCPA, CPRA, with the introduction of general duties and uh, definitions of uh, business purposes. The claim that I'd like to make here is that purpose limitation and their minimization are core safeguards, so I'm echoing uh, other speakers, as much as the identification techniques, if not more. And this is true for three fundamental reasons. First, the legitimacy of the processing can only be derived from the processing purpose, not from the de-identification technique that is applied on the data. The identification only mitigates against concerns related to confidentiality and privacy is much more than the protection of the confidentiality of the information. And this is true even if individuals do not raise objections against the processing 
uh, has been said that uh, consent is not the best way to protect individuals in that space. Second, de-identification in fact implies purpose limitation and data minimization. Why? Because the identification is risk-based. Zero risk cannot be guaranteed. And in practice, um, what we see is that purpose limitation and data minimization are used as uh, best practice for de-identifying data, in particular in the healthcare space, uh, to do export determination, for example. Uh, and even to try to meet the CCPA de-identification test, purpose-based access control and monitoring here is the key. Uh, and finally, lots of processing activities obviously will, not require, uh, will require processing in plain text in the clear. Therefore, uh, de-identification is not always an option. In my work, I've tried to show that it is possible to reconcile purpose limitation and data minimization and data-driven activities by adopting a dynamic approach to purpose limitation and data minimization and distinguishing between exploratory purposes uh, and decision-making, in particular, individual decision-making. And this research work has been confirmed by my experience in industry. Uh, if you just take an example, the data mesh paradigm, for example, that is being used to build data architectures it forces organizations to organize their activities by problem spaces. Um, so uh, they are good signs also within the industry. Um, the CCPA standards for purpose limitation and uh, minimization appear below what we have in the GDPR, uh, which is not just that the guidance has been issued on GDPR has always been very clear. Uh, the question is therefore whether more specificity should be required in order to make data minimization more meaningful, uh, or whether requiring more specificity for purpose limitation would be self-defeating and would undermine innovation. I'll be clear, pushing for more specificity is good practice to be able to better anticipate individual harm and achieve a higher degree of data minimization, which is actually a requirement also for security only. As long as purpose limitation and data minimization principles are understood dynamically. In other words, purposes can be and should be refined over time, just like the amount of data that is being processed to pursue these purposes. How do we achieve more specificity? Um, if you look at the GDPR, for example, they, through the distinction between legal bases and purposes, they try to uh, push for more specificity. This is not the only way to do it. Uh, there are other ways. Uh, in particular, the distinction between legal basis and purposes can be confusing, but this does not mean that uh, it's not possible to push for more specificity. And in fact, I would encourage the agency to say, yes, they consider different ways to incentivize more specificity. Um, as previous speakers have been saying earlier, strict interpretation of the requirements of compatibility of purposes uh, is, is one way to do that. To require more specificity in privacy notices even if they are not very often uh, uh, read by users. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is a starting point. This is forcing organizations to think about their processing activities, to require more specificity also within recording obligations uh, can make the difference, and to impose risk assessment obligations uh, in which purposes and sub-purposes can then be uh, unpacked. And with this, um, I, 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 I finish my speak. I thank you, the agency, and we'll be happy to, to uh, continue to engage with the work. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment. Uh, thank you. That was our last uh, speaker that was signed up for this session. So I want to thank everyone that spoke so far this morning. We're going to take a short 30-minute break um, until our next session, which is on dark patterns. We'll reconvene for that session at 10 o'clock. Please feel free to leave the video or teleconference open or to log out and back in at 10 o'clock when our session on dark patterns resumes. Thank you.
It's now 10 a.m. and I'd like to welcome you all back to the California Privacy Protection Agency's May 2022 pre-rulemaking stakeholder sessions. I would also like to remind you that the session is being recorded. Speakers that are scheduled to speak during this current session on dark patterns should be signed into the public Zoom link using their name or pseudonym, an email they provided when they signed up to request their speaking slot. Speakers will be called on in alphabetical order by last name during this window, and we will not be able to wait if you miss your slot. When it's your turn, our moderator will call your name and invite you to speak. If you hear your name, please raise your hand when your name is called using the raise your hand function, which can be found in the reaction feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our moderator will invite you to unmute yourself and also invite you to turn on your camera if you wish. You will have seven minutes to provide your comments. In order to accommodate everyone, we will be strictly keeping time and speaking for a shorter length of time is just fine. When your comment is completed, the moderator will mute you. Please plan to focus your remarks on your main topic. However, if you'd like to say something about other topics of interest at the end of your remarks, you are welcome to do so. You're also welcome to raise your hand during the portion at the end of the day uh, that we've set aside for general public comments. Finally, you, you may also send us your comments via physical mail or email them to regulations at cppa.ca.gov by 6 p.m. Friday. California law requires the CPPA to refrain from using its prestige or influence to endorse or recommend any specific product or service. Consequently, during your presentation, we ask that you also refrain from recommending or endorsing any specific product or service. I now ask the stakeholders who have been assigned the topic of dark patterns to be ready to present. Please use the raise your hand function in Zoom when your name is called so that our moderator can easily see you. As noted, the moderator will call you in alphabetical order by last name. We will now move to hear comments on the topic of dark patterns. Ms. Hurtado, can you please call our first speaker? Uh, yes, the first speaker for this session is Amy Allshouse. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Allshouse, your time will be seven minutes. It starts now. Thank Please. you. Thank you for this opportunity to share my thoughts on dark patterns. I am a second year law student studying privacy law, and I have been a web developer for over 20 years. I would like to encourage the agency to engage in rulemaking and give guidance to businesses and other online entities on dark patterns. <clears throat> this is about valid consumer consent, in essence, not tricking people, both in relation to getting people to give their data and to make purchases. The purpose behind dark pattern regulations is to ensure that online entities cease using misdirection, confusion, or psychological manipulation to gain data or complete transactions. Regulating dark patterns will help consumers and businesses by creating an online environment with less uncertainty and more safety. I'll briefly talk about four dark patterns that I request the agency regulate, and I'll explain briefly what I mean by each practice. I'll talk about overt deception, hidden costs, forced continuity, and the most important category, deceptive designs. Overt deception means inducing action based on false beliefs. So a false countdown timer or the indication that there's only one item left when that's not the case. Hidden costs mean hiding the real purchase price until the checkout page. And in some cases, maybe where services are provided, this can even happen after checkout. Forced continuity is usually a free trial where credit card information is required and then there is no reminder to cancel before the free trial is over and the consumer automatically begins paying or it is just incredibly difficult to cancel a service. Finally, 
deceptive design. I would suggest we adopt this language to refer to dark patterns uh, instead of calling them dark patterns because deceptive design is a clearer way to refer to these practices and can be more universally understood. So deceptive design is anything that serves to trick or confuse. Uh, it can be as simple as making one option prominent and another option hidden, but it's any desi design, it's hard to say this, any, it's any design decision that psychologically manipulates a consumer or a site visitor. And essentially these practices, all of these practices have no place in a healthy online world. The core value in regulating here is transparency, which I will, which I believe will be better, not only obviously for consumers, but for all, for online entities in general, businesses and others alike, because it will raise the quality of online experiences overall. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your comment. Our next commenter will be Cassia. Artengara. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Artengara, you have seven minutes. Your time starts now. You may use your camera if you wish. Hi, thank you for inviting me to speak. My name is Kasha Arjunagata, speaking on dark patterns. I'm a UX designer and program manager at a program called Data Curious, whose uh, mission is to empower individuals and communities to make informed decisions about their data. I have a background in computer science and art, and my work revolves around researching, designing, and communicating better relationships between humans, the data we produce, and the entities that use that data. I speak today as an advocate for what industry typically calls users and consumers. Um, and my work centers the humanity of these people who are exploited by a system of entities prioritizing profit over people. I won't get into all of that, but I urge you to make three calls, calls to action today. One is to cl clearly define dark patterns. Two is to provide examples of good and bad privacy controls. And three is to shift the burden of responsibility from users to companies by restricting how companies can collect, use, and profit from data. Now I'll expand on those three calls to action. So the first, um, we need to define dark patterns more clearly. The current CCPA definition defines a dark pattern as a user interface designed or manipulated with a substantial effect of subverting or impairing user autonomy, decision-making, choice, um, as further defined by regulation. This is a great starting point, but this definition needs to be expanded to identify the specific dark patterns that might influence a person to make a decision that they didn't mean to make or is harmful to their well being. An example of this is, um, you know, I'm sure you've seen in cookie consent banners how prominent the accept button is styled. So it's bigger, bolder, brighter, and the reject button is not as visible. Um, this can also be as subtle as a, a choice in the words that's used um, that implies that a user has already given consent, which can then prime them to consent. Um, additionally, the specific context where a dark pattern may appear need to be called out. So when you think about the last app that you used or the last website you used, there are so many decisions that you've made throughout your engagement with that app that might be touched by a dark pattern. Um, an example is deceptive marketing that kind of positions an app as one thing when its true purpose is to collect data about their users. And that deceptive marketing can influence you to download that app without really knowing the full consequences of that. Um, I do wanna call out that dark patterns aren't necessarily always malicious. Sometimes they're just a result of sloppy or thoughtless design. And so actually calling them out explicitly can help companies uh, avoid accidentally using dark patterns and also encourages companies to provide privacy controls that affirm humanity and agency. My second call to action is to provide concrete examples of good and bad privacy controls. 
there aren't many examples of really great privacy controls, nor are there specific standards or regulations. Um, and we can elevate that standard or define that by saying explicitly, like, here's what that looks like, rather than waiting for a company to, you know, get there on their own. Um, that would be a really valuable resource for companies, especially smaller ones who are navigating and trying to adapt to changing privacy regulations. I do also acknowledge that ex explicitly prescribing those examples could hinder technological innovation or even be rendered obsolete in a few years when we have the next new, uh, uh, the next new technology. So that is something that needs to be balanced and navigated um, in the future. So far, I've made two recommendations um, to explicitly define dark patterns and to call out the context in which they appear, but these are simply not enough. Consumers should not have the burden of navigating harmful and exploitative data practices. The burden should be on companies and they shouldn't be allowed to do those things in the first place. Um, to really fully understand how your data is collected, aggregated, shared, sold, and stored across a web of interlocking parties. You practically need a data science degree or at the very least have a really strong and solid contextual understanding of the data ecosystem. And it's unrealistic, it's unfair, it's inaccessible, and frankly unethical to ask everyone who uses the internet, which is a very broad range of people, to have that contextual understanding and to consider the far reaching and material consequences in a single consent screen when they're in the middle of trying to do something else. So my final recommendation to you is to restrict how companies can collect, use, and profit from data, shifting the burden of responsibilities from consumers to companies. After all, the data we produce is an extension of our own humanity, and that humanity deserves protection by our CPRA legislation. Thank you, Thank you so much for your comment. Our next commenter is Marshini Chetty. Marshini Chetty, please raise your hand. Marshini Chetty. Okay, uh, we'll move on to Donna Fraser. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Fraser, you have seven minutes to speak. Your time starts now. You may use your camera if you wish. You may speak. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning. So my name is Donna Frazier and I am Senior Vice President of Privacy Initiatives at BBB National Programs. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to address the California Privacy Protection Agency today regarding your upcoming rulemaking. Um, I'm proud to be here to represent our nonprofit organization headquartered near Washington, DC. Our privacy team has more than 20 years of experience advancing privacy best practices and operating independent third-party accountability programs to help businesses and consumers navigate privacy challenges in the digital marketplace. BBB National Programs works with individual companies, industry groups, and regulators to develop, monitor, and enforce robust privacy standards that have been built either on self-regulatory principles or legal requirements across various data types such as children's data, interest-based advertising or cross-border data transfers. Um, a key component of our mission at BBB National Programs is to bring stakeholders together in a self-regulatory environment to help craft enforceable and fair mechanisms that protect consumers in the marketplace and enable responsible businesses to compete on trust and accountability. Um, in the area of dark patterns, more enforcement and accountability within the business community is needed. Our view is that companies must be held accountable, not only to legal requirements, but also to industry best practices and standards. Um, the prevalence of manipulative or deceptive design in the digital marketplace has led to legislative proposals, such as California's current privacy laws, um, to prevent consumer deception and preserve consumer autonomy. 
while the FTC Act's prohibition on deceptive practices necessarily makes certain types of dark patterns illegal, it is far from a comprehensive enforceable standard in the industry. So through our work, we have come to know well the blurry edges that exist between poor disclosures and deceptive designs, as well as the mismatch that often occurs when considering consumer experience and consumer privacy. We can say with confidence that a third party self-regulatory accountability program to establish standards in this space <clears throat> and monitor the marketplace for compliance to those standards would be a critical support to the work of this agency and the work of the FTC. Um, regarding the specific term of dark patterns, I know from previous speakers today and in the past that we at BBB National Programs are not alone in strongly suggesting that laws, regulations, and the industry as a whole move away from using the term. The definitions under both CCPA and CPRA use the word design or designed, which more accurately pinpoints the behavior and practices the law desires to address. Manipulative designs or deceptive designs would be more precise. And although the law does not determine intent, there is something quite implicit in the use of words such as manipulative or deceptive. Um, for example, our Children's Advertising Review Unit, which was established in 1974 to protect children and their data in an online environment, monitors the marketplace for compliance with our self-regulatory advertising guidelines, which state that advertisements, apps, or games should not use unfair, deceptive, or other manipulative tactics, including but not limited to deceptive door openers or social pressure or validation to encourage ad viewing or in-app or in-game purchases or to cause children to inadvertently or unknowingly engage with an ad. Um, and the guidelines go on to state that any method provided to dismiss or exit must be clear and conspicuous. Um, these same principles apply to the collection of data and avoid using the term dark patterns, instead describing the company's behavior and practices. Um, in addition to our recommendation on clear language around dark patterns in your rulemaking, we also recommend the following. And first is uniformity of disclosures. Um, a required uniformity on the presentation of disclosures would likely reduce the use of deceptive or manipulative design. Such uniformity would prevent the use of language that may dissuade a user from making a well-informed decision. In our written submission, we provided some examples to demonstrate the current range of disclosure language used across the marketplace. Um, secondly, um, with regards to education, the California law, as we know, is aligned with the Federal um, Children's Online Privacy Protection Act when dealing with data from users under age 13. But for users age 13 to 16, California requires an affirmative opt-in to not sell personal information to a third party. This approach makes sense to us at BBB National Programs because we are deeply rooted in our understanding of the unique privacy risks for teen users who are not protected by COPPA. Um, however, additional education is required for businesses and consumers to ensure they fully understand the unique risks to the teen audience, particularly for those companies whose products are intended for users above 13 years old and whom to date have not been required to implement age gates or other guardrails to determine whether their users are teenagers. Should the agency desire additional information, we'd be happy to share a catalog of known risks um, that are unique to teen users. Um, thirdly, um, efficacy of consent. Um, at this point, we would ask, is it enough to only provide consumers the ability to opt out? Or should consumers of all ages be able to easily and readily know whether their choices have been honored? Um, and what is the recourse if their choices are, have not been honored? Um, can efficacy be properly monitored and enforced? Um, then with that understanding, you could clearly define consent and the accountability mechanisms in place when user privacy is breached. Um, at BBB National Programs, companies across various industries have proven their ability to hold themselves accountable to industry standards and best practices that align to state and federal law when educated, informed, and held accountable. In such cases, government agencies such as the FTC act as a regulatory backstop when companies do not adhere to established guidelines. In one such case, internet and social media advertisements made by Quicken Loans were referred to the FTC when the company failed to respond to an accountability inquiry by the National Advertising Division of BBB National Programs. In its advertising, Quicken Loans encourages consumers to refinance their mortgage and mortgage warning. about its low refinancing rates, claiming no registration, no login. Um, further, the Quicken Loans privacy policy indicates it collects and shares personal data, contrary to the implied message of the no registration, no login claim. Um, the FTC supports independent industry self-regulation 
and keeps a transparent record of its actions in response to cases. This system requires that companies are held accountable not only to legal requirements, but also to industry best practices and standards. If legal requirements are established that are clearly your defined. No. Ms. Fraser, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment. Our next commenter is Eric Goldman. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Goldman, you have seven minutes to speak. Your time starts now. Feel free to use your camera if you wish. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Eric Goldman, a law professor at Santa Clara University School of Law, where I direct the school's privacy law certificate. My blog posts about the CCPA have all featured the dumpster fire GIF. I'm still deciding what GIF I'm going to use with my CPRA posts. I'd like to start by thanking the agency board members and staff for their hard work on this overwhelming project that voters assigned to it. It's a thankless effort that will garner criticism on all sides so I'm grateful for your willingness to serve. My first substantive point relates to the bills in the California legislature proposing to add new duties to the CPPA's remit. I'm baffled by these proposals because the CPPA's plate is already very clearly full. The CPPA can already cannot meet the deliverable schedule approved by the voters. So it's in no position to take on additional projects that would further compromise the CPPA's ability to meet its voter approved obligations. The CPPA's workload won't get any better after the CPPA completes its initial batch of rulemaking. The CPPA will then have the enormous and complex challenge of building an enforcement function from scratch. Even more bizarrely, some of the legislative proposals have proposed adding non-privacy matters to the CPPA's remit, such as making the CPPA responsible for children's well-being under the guise of defining dark patterns. This scope expansion is impossible because the CPRA's directives to the CPPA are privacy specific. So the CPPA lacks the ability to oversee non-privacy topics while still adhering to its voter mandated directives. This takes me to my first suggestion. I encourage the CPPA to proactively and emphatically tell the legislature that one, it cannot take on new privacy matters until it's able to satisfy its existing voter directives. And two, it will never be in a position to take on non-privacy matters without completely restructuring the CPRA's directives to the CPPA. My second substantive point is to observe how much of the CPPA's rulemaking, including most of the topics covered by these stakeholder sessions, are essentially addressing empirical questions but we frequently have minimal or no empir independent empirical research to answer those questions. As just one example, businesses apparently have been required to honor the global privacy control since AG Becerra tweeted about it in January 2021. How's that going? Are there independent empirical studies of the GPC's costs and benefits since then? Is the GPC achieving its purported goals for consumers or not? The CPPA may not know the answer to those questions, but the empirical answers are essential to the efficacy and legitimacy of any further CPPA rulemaking on the topic. The same is true for any rulemaking on dark patterns. The CPPA has received a bit of empirical data on the topic, but every detail of any dark patterns rule will be predicated on empirically answerable uh, questions, even if the CPPA doesn't actually rely on empirics when defining those details. In particular, there's been far too little independent empirical research into the CPPA's uh, efficacy, uh, despite the fact that the CPPA has generated substantial field data over the past few years. Worse, due to its timing, the CPRA did not incorporate any empirical findings from the CPPA, I'm sorry, from the CCPA's operation. Given where we are now, it would be very unfortunate to ignore these empirics in the CPRA's rulemaking without learning uh, how, from how businesses and consumers are actually behaving in the field, the CPPA could easily misdirect its efforts or possibly make things worse for everyone. That takes me to my second suggestion. I encourage the, C the CPPA 
to make explicit any empirical assumptions it's based its rules on, then when the CPPA does not currently have data in hand to support the assumptions it's making, the CPPA should one, solicit independent researchers to study those empirical questions, and two, set sunset dates for those rules to ensure that they will be reevaluated as new empirical data informs the questions. The CPPA has an enormous amount of hard work ahead of it. And again, I say thank you to those of you doing that work. Thank you so much for your comment, Mr. Goldman. Our next commenter will be Jennifer Huddleston. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Huddleston, you have seven minutes. Your seven minutes starts now. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to participate in today's stakeholder session. My name is Jennifer Huddleston and I'm a policy counsel with Net Choice, a trade association dedicated to preserving free enterprise and free expression online. As the CCPA, as this, I'm sorry, as the CPPA considers how to handle privacy rulemaking, the agency should avoid overly expansive actions that would penalize the uses of neutral technology in a way that may undermine many of the beneficial uses of technologies, such as algorithms, that consumers experience regularly. And, can, and these same technologies can even provide new solutions related to privacy, security, and authentication. The CPPA should carefully consider the impact that its decisions may have beyond privacy and how they interact with existing laws and tools to resolve the underlying consumer concerns that the agency seeks to address related to privacy and security. As with any regulations, the agency should consider the impact these rules have on these technologies and users and ensure that the rules are grounded in their mandate related to privacy and balance concerns about other issues such as speech and innovation. The agency should avoid dictating a specific design that does not take into account the differences in technologies, types of data collected, and user preferences. And the agency should also consider how existing laws and regulations may address some of the underlying concerns that it is seeking to address. When it comes to dark patterns, the agency should be cautious of the negative impacts that overregulation may have and seek to address specific harms. Any regulations the agency considers should have clear definitions of the harmful behavior it seeks to redress to avoid unintentionally prohibiting neutral or beneficial practices and consumer privacy preferences. As research around patterns has previously discussed, many of the concerns around manipulative options that are commonly referred to as dark patterns are most likely already capable of being addressed by existing precedents around unfair and deceptive practices. An overzealous approach could result in an agency dictating user interface designs without full consideration of the distinctions in products, services, audience, or communication methods. In some cases, providing a very specific and clear feature like a single button may work simply. In other cases, a product may need multiple steps or multiple choices and a way to clearly communicate to a consumer what each of those different privacy choices may do to the user experience. There might not be malicious intent, but rather an attempt to ensure that consumers fully understand the impact of their choice on their experience with a, with a product, service, or device. And we have a wide range of consumer preferences when it comes to their privacy online and the trade-offs that they may be willing to make. As with many privacy scenarios, often there are two great tools available to policymakers beyond regulation, and that is considering consumer education and redressing the harmful conduct through existing through policies that may already be in existence. This includes pursuing those back actors who are engaged in deceptive and manipulative practices, similar to as would be done in offline settings with regards to consumer protection violations, and that the, this enforcement be tied to specific consumer harms as the laws were intended to. This can include providing clarity around the, the harm seeking to be redressed, but it should also recognize that design differences may arise depending on the product and service being offered. Policy, policymakers should be cautious in, perform, in presuming that data collection or interaction with consumers is inherently harmful and instead seek to address only those specific actions that are harmful to consumers, such as unfair and deceptive practices. 
In addition to regulation, the agency should also consider a less interventionist approach that would empower consumers and innovators to make choices that support privacy decisions that align with a consumer's individual preference and help the consumer identify when they may, when they may notice a deceptive and unfair practice and what to do in those cases. I thank you for this opportunity to speak during this pre-rulemaking phase, and I thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment, Ms. Huddleston. Our next commenter will be Noreen Weisel. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Weisel, you have seven minutes to speak. You may use your camera if you wish. Your time starts now. Good morning. I'm Noreen Weisel, Director of Validation Research at the Me To Be Alliance. I should note that today we've changed our name to the Internet Safety Labs. We are a nonprofit safety testing organization for connected technology, where I lead qualitative research to understand people's experiences and relationships with the technologies they use. I'm a professor in communication design at CUNY's New York City College of Technology and have written and presented on re uh, research on dark patterns, accessibility, and uh, vulnerable populations. Up front, I'd like to present our recommendations regarding CPRA and dark patterns, and then describe them further during this time. So first, as others mentioned, stop using the term dark patterns. Focus on the harmful outcomes of these interfaces by calling them what they are, harmful UI patterns. Two, opt out should be the default condition, not a choice. This is a big one for us. Three, adopt a framework for identifying harmful UI patterns at each stage of a technology relationship. We also have specific recommendations about the definitions of consent and intentional interaction, with all, which I'll describe if I have time. Uh, first of all, dark patterns. In CPRA, the definition of dark pattern affirms that designers are responsible for the effects of the UI pattern that causes harms. The outcome of the interaction is important. We state in our B2B rules of engagement that technology should not willfully harm their users, but there is a willful neglect in adopting UI patterns just because they are easy or because they are embedded in the systems we use to design a product. That said, I'd like to use my time to focus on the outcome of these harmful UI patterns and notice that I didn't say dark. Industry is redefining so-called dark patterns as deceptive patterns and California should follow suit. Last month, Harry Brignell, the British ethicist well known to have coined the dark patterns phrase, changed his darkpatterns.org website name and URL to deceptive.design following a trend championed by organizations such as the Web Foundation's Tech Policy Design Lab, who represent the new label as more inclusive. In fact, we at the, we, we at the me to be Alliance prefer the term harmful UI patterns as it describes the outcome of the design pattern that affects the individual agency of the technology consumer. We know from our research that people understand they're being treated unfairly and they they know that good UI patterns use clear and specific language so that they can make decisions without feeling coerced. Two, opt out versus opt in. The reliance on opt out from data sharing as a choice requires a user action to be affected. This opens the door to harmful UI patterns. We support the practice of easy to use opt in methods with opt out set as the default. Requiring people to opt out is one of the harmful UI patterns frequently cited in literature in Brignell's research and is further defined in a dark pattern taxonomy developed by Purdue University's User Experience Pedagogy and Practice Lab as um, the use of uh, checkboxes to opt out rather than to opt in. And this is listed and categorized in their taxonomy as interface interference. Requiring opt out, whether paired with confusing wordings or not, creates an asymmetrical power dynamic leading to harmful levels of data sharing and surveillance tracking and to a disruption of agency in people who use technology. Um, and it does not promote the safety and well being of people and is not harmonized with global norms. In addition, we should not assume people know that they need to opt out. Instead, allow people the agency to decide whether to opt in. 
third, a framework for identifying harmful UI patterns would be helpful, especially given, excuse me, especially given that many potential U, harmful UI patterns have yet to be designed. It would help designers to understand when they occur and what kinds of harms they cause. Harmful UI patterns exist along the spectrum of the entire technology relationship beginning before an account is made and or other user relationship is established and until well after it is terminated. I emphasize this because people don't always know that these UI patterns can exist before the traditional onboarding stages and after account termination. To provide clarity, the me to be Alliance has identified what we call a me to be relationship life cycle or transactional stages that occur during technology use over time where consent to various actions occur. These commitments map to the stages of social interactions as defined by George Levinger from acquaintance, buildup, marriage, deterioration, and termination. In each of these stages, there is a potential for introducing harmful UI patterns and negative UX con outcomes. Um, in the initial acquaintance stage, for example, harmful patterns might include making it difficult to view content without creating an account, requiring people to share personal uh, contacts or enter a, a credit card number. In the buildup and onboarding stage, requiring access to contents or location information while signing up for newsletters, notifications, or loyalty programs uh, when any of these data aren't necessary, aren't necessary or legitimate um, are examples of harms. Long convoluted and nag nagging processes for closing an account or reducing other levels of commitments are also harmful. And requiring opt out or requiring people to deselect opt in at any stage is harmful. The establishment of each commitment may not be obvious to users, but in what we call the invisible parallel dataverse, data is collected and shared with third parties and the temptation to use deceptive or harmful UI patterns to accelerate data collection at each commitment stage is a risk. These patterns are frustrating and can encourage people to stop using the service without closing their account, which then preserves data sharing settings in perpetuity, another example of the unequal power dynamic between technology and user. I've also had a couple of comments on the definition of consent and intentional interaction in the legislation. Um, because they use the term dark pattern um, in, in the case of consent, which should be used, um, we should be warning. using harmful. Um, and in intentional interaction, it sort of implies that opening a website is an intention uh, to interact and we've all fallen for dark patterns, um, for harmful patterns um, that are designed to get you to load something that you didn't intend to. Um, in sum, the reg regulations definition to of exactly what UX designs will constitute a harmful UI pattern remains unclear and requires specific guidelines, starting with language that aligns with global norms, harmful patterns, not dark Excuse patterns. Excuse me, Ms. Weissel, your time is come to an end. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to participate. Thank you everyone for your comments on this session on dark patterns. Um, we're now going to take a break until our next session on consumer rights to opt out, which begins at 12 o'clock um, when we will rec reconvene for that session. Please feel free to leave the video on or teleconference open or to log out now and back in at 12 o'clock when we begin that session on consumer rights to opt out. Thank you.
It's 12 o'clock. Um, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you back to the California Privacy Protection Agency's May 2022 pre-rulemaking stakeholder session. I'd like to remind everyone that the session is being recorded. Um, speakers that are scheduled for the current session on consumer rights to opt out should be signed in to the public Zoom link using the, their name or pseudonym and the email they provided when they signed up to request their speaking slot. If you're participating by phone, you will have already provided the number that you'll be calling from so that we may call you during your pre-appointed speaking slot. Note your name and phone number may be visible to the public during the live session and our subsequent recording. Speakers will be called in alphabetical order by last name during this window, and we will not be able to wait if you miss your slot. When it is your turn, our moderator will call your name and invite you to speak. If you hear your name, please raise your hand when your name is called using the raise your hand function, which can be found in the reaction feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our moderator will then invite you to unmute yourself and also invite you to turn your camera on if you wish. You will have seven minutes to provide your comments. In order to accommodate everyone, we will be strictly keeping time and speaking for a short amount, shorter amount length of time is just fine. When your comment is completed, the moderator will mute you. Please plan to focus your remarks on your main topic. However, if you'd like to say something about other topics of interest at the end of your remarks, you're welcome to do so. You are also welcome to raise your hand during the public portion at the end of each day for general public comment. Finally, you may also send us your comments via physical mail or email them to regulations at cppa.ca.gov by 6 p.m. tomorrow, May 6th. California law requires that the CPPA refrain from using its prestige or influence to endorse or recommend any specific product or service. Consequently, during your presentation, we ask that you also refrain from recommending or endorsing any specific product or service. I now ask that stakeholders who have been assigned to the consumer rights to opt out session be ready to present. Please use the raise your hand function in Zoom when your name is called so that our moderator can easily see you. As noted, the moderator will call you in alphabetical order by last name. We will now move to hear comments on the topic of consumer rights to opt out. Mr. Tato, could you please call the first speaker? Uh, yes, good afternoon. Our first speaker for this session is Robin Berjan. Robin Bergeon, please raise your hand. Okay, we'll move on to the next speaker, Justin Brookman. Justin Brookman, please raise your hand. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Brookman, you have seven minutes to speak. Your time begins now. Thank you very much. My name is Justin Brookman. I am head of technology policy at Consumer Reports, previously of the Federal Trade Commission and New York Attorney General's office. Um, this is a session on the right to opt out. So I wanna talk about the inherent difficulty of using opt out. Um, if you generally don't want your data sold, then it is not practically possible to communicate that individually and separately to every business that you interact with. You have to scroll to the bottom of a website, find the link, engage with that opt-out process. Every site you go to, every store you go to, you need to fill out a separate form, maybe for each transaction. Every app you have, you need to find the bespoke controls and individually opt out. In general, people don't want to have to make granular privacy choices all the time. They don't want to deal with constant cookie consent screens, asking them what kind of cookies they're fine with on any given website. They just want their services to work. And for the vast majority of people, they universally do not want their data sold or shared to others. So a year and a half ago, Consumer Reports conducted an exhaustive study on the usability of CCPA opt-outs. We uh, crowdsourced hundreds of people to go to the California Data Broker website and opt out of the sale of their data for just one data broker. Um, as you might expect, the results were pretty much a mess for almost half, to the, half of the sites 
Um, people couldn't even find an opt-out link. Um, people were asked for sensitive information to upload a picture of their driver's license. They were told they needed to install cook allow cookies. A lot of our survey participants just completely noped out of the process, didn't finish even one opt-out. Um, at least one person got added to a new marketing list <laughs> trying to do the CCPA opt-out. And uh, overall, half the people that we surveyed told us they were somewhat dissatisfied or very dissatisfied with the opt-out process. Um, and that's just trying to opt out of one, <laughs> one single company. So for opt-out of sharing to be usable in practice, there need to be global opt-out options um, to let people broadcast to everyone all at once. They don't want their data sold or shared. Uh, this was included in CCPA and laid out in detail in the CCPA regs. Um, this was added to the Colorado privacy law that was enacted last year. It was included in the Connecticut privacy law that was uh, passed by the legislature uh, last week. Um, it was expanded upon in the CPRA. Um, so I will say I've, I've been disappointed um, to hear lobbyists arguing that we should go backward, uh, that honoring opt-out signals should now be optional under the CPRA, uh, that if a company receives a generally recognized symbol, a signal, communicating that this person does not want their data sold or shared, then that company should feel free to ignore that under California law. Uh, instead, companies should be uh, consumers should be required to find and navigate hundreds or thousands of individual opt-out processes that are harder to use. Um, a lot of these processes actually predate the CCPA. They've always been around, but, the, but they've never actually been used. Um, the reason the CCPA was passed in the first place was because these individual individual opt-outs were not practical or usable for folks. Um, and I will say that this interpretation of optional opt-out, opt optional response to uh, universal signals is completely anathema to the spirit and the text of the CPRA. Um, so under CPRA, Section 135 has two different options for a company to offer do not sell choices or do not share, share choices, um, depending on whether the company reserves the right to, to push back or nudge the consumer. Um, but Section 135E is quite clear. Uh, a consumer may authorize another person to opt out of the shale, sale or sharing of their data, including through an opt out preference signal indicating the consumer's intent to opt out. And a business shall comply with an opt out request received from a person authorized by the consumer to act, regardless of whether the business has elected to comply with subdivision A or B of the section. The text is clear. Uh, CPA, CPRA was intended to build upon and extend the CCPA, not to backtrack. I will say that if CPRA is interpreted to counterintuitively not require adherence to uh, universal signals, then in practice, the law is going to be a failure and consumers are not going to, Californians are not going to have the ability to practically limit the sharing or selling of their data. Um, I do think there are a few ways that the CPA, CPPA can make compliance with universal signals easier for companies. I think uh, the CPPA should host and update a, li a list of signals that should be interpreted by folks as binding CPRA requests. Um, you know, they could, um, different, maybe different signals for different user agents, like web browsers have some signals, um, mobile devices may have a separate signal for apps to respond to, smart TVs might develop their own global opt-out signal for different apps on the TV. Um, it's still difficult and tedious for consumers to manage um, settings uh, on different devices, um, but it's still easier than per website or per app or per channel. Um, and I think it's completely reasonable to give companies some grace period when a new signal is adopted to give them some time to code and, and to be able to respond to, to those signals. Um, finally, I, I will just want to add that I, I am worried um, about companies responding to universal opt-out signals with constant requests to ignore it. <laughs> um, this is why the CPRA actually adopted the bifurcated structure that it did. Um, but I don't think uh, absolving companies of the need to put up do not sell links is going to be enough incentive for them not to bug the user and say, hey, can we ignore this signal? So I think the CPPA is going to need to put up guardrails on when and how companies um, can ask to ignore signals to, to guard against abusive dark patterns and to not recreate the European experience of just relentless, countless, confusing consent streams that consumers don't want. They just generally want it to work. And, they, and, and for again, for most people, they just don't want their data sold or shared. Um, thank you very much for your time. Happy to answer any questions folks might have. Thank you so much for your comment. Our next commenter, we are going to uh, try Robin Bergeon again. Thank you.
Robin Bergeon, please raise your hand. Hello, I believe it works now. Sorry okay, about that. Thank you. Zoom <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, your seven minutes will start now, Mr. Bergeon. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, hi everyone. Um, thank you for your time and thank you for inviting me today. As just mentioned, my name is Robin Bergen. I am VP of Data Governance at the New York Times. And my focus there is on privacy, but more broadly on sustainable business models around data for news publishers. Um, the feedback that I'm offering today is based on my team's work implementing the CCPA's Do Not Sell opt-out across all New York Times properties, and also in supporting the global privacy control or GPC signal in production on nytimes.com for well over a year now. Um, the first thing that I want to say is, is from a strictly business perspective, the more people opt out, the better for us. Broadcasting personal data might help with next quarter's bottom line, and, and that's actually why, why people do it. Uh, but longer term, as a publisher, giving away our audience data for third parties to profit from independently is equivalent to tossing your, you know, our most valuable asset out the window. Um, people think of opt-outs as a privacy issue, and it, and it really is, but just as importantly for us, it is an opportunity to develop business practices that are not detrimental to publishers in the way that today's inconsequential data practices are. Um, we don't typically share precise audience numbers, but a quite significant number of Californian readers have opted out on our properties, and we find that excellent. Uh, the DNS opt-out uh, state represents for us, you know, some kind of really pragmatic compromise, compromise um, in which it's possible for us to, to, to show effective and relevant ad campaigns, but without giving away our core, core data assets to third parties. Um, and so, you know, one thing I, I really want to emphasize here is that the ability to rely on a, you know, as part of this opt-out structure on a standardized signal like GPC for us is a, is a really big win. Uh, it makes it significantly easier for people to opt out, which in turn is good for us as publishers. Uh, implementing a standard signal like, like GPC is, is a lot simpler and a lot cheaper. Uh, and it also makes delivering ads more efficient, which in turn just makes us money. Um, and also, you know, I think it would be confusing to people if some sites supported GPC and others had a do not sell button. So I really think that from a, from a pure user experience uh, and a pure coherence per perspective, both are needed. Uh, but, you know, returning to GPC, supporting GPC makes, makes things really simpler for, for people and businesses. And uh, I, I've been a bit disappointed to hear GPC being described as, as, as complex because GPC is just one bit of information. Um, and so that's basically the, the smallest amount of information possible. And I think that, I, you know, I, I really wonder if a company that, that finds manipulating one bit um, uh, daunting is really equipped to, to, to properly handle any amount of, of personal data. Um, one thing that, that uh, is also relevant, uh, I, I feel, as someone who works in standards and has been working around browsers um, for the past 20 years, uh, is the question of whether browsers and other such systems would be able to set the global privacy control and the GPC signal on by default. Um, and I think that if they didn't, um, we, should, we, we might wish to look at it as, as potentially a deceptive claim. Um, when, when, they, when they make privacy claims. People overwhelmingly expect their browsers not to share data with third parties. GPC is evidently an improvement to privacy and it's really easy to brow for browsers to implement. Several have already done it. Um, so I feel it would be deceptive for a browser to claim that they care about their users' privacy but not have GPC on by default. Um, so, you know, with this in mind, I really think that having GPC on by default in browsers um, is the only option that realistically matches uh, uh, people's expectations. On a small negative note, and that is the pretty much the only negative note that I have uh, to report from the do not sell experience, um, the CCPA regulations added a requirement that, that I feel was a mistake. Um, the initial, ex you know, do not sell button um, experience that the Times had implemented uh, was such that the user would just click it and immediately be opted out. Instead, the regs 
made it a, a requirement for us to show a notice after the user had clicked the button. And this just degraded the experience. Exci we really feel that exercising one's rights should be pleasant experience. And so if at all possible, please do, you know, let, let, do not make it ruin the opt-out experience with, with additional notices. But apart from this small issue, I really want to return you know, uh, to emphasize that our experience supporting Do Not Sell has been positive. Uh, it's been positive from a business standpoint. Uh, the availability of a standard GPC signal is great for us and for our readers. And I really hope that this is the first step towards a future in which the digital business models um, that we have to rely on are better for both privacy and publishers, because these two things are, are, are very much aligned. And with this, thank you very much for your time, and I wish you an excellent day. Thank you so much for your comment. Our next commenter will be Ronak Delami. Ronak Delami. Hi. Hello. You have seven minutes. Your time starts now. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ronak Delami. I'm the policy advocate on privacy and cybersecurity issues for the California Chamber of Commerce, speaking today on behalf of our 14,000 members who employ over 25% of the private sector workforce in California. My personal experience in this area also includes staffing the authors of the CCPA throughout the passage of that law in my former role as the chief consultant for the Assembly Privacy Committee. <clears throat> I cannot stress enough that businesses both want to comply with the law and support privacy rights and regulations that are clear and workable. This is the perspective from which we approach these topics, trying to identify operational issues and unintended consequences to make compliance both feasible and less burdensome on businesses and to ensure that the rights operate as intended in practice. We thank you for providing us the opportunity to speak here today. Our primary feedback will be on the issue of the global opt-out signal. First and foremost, we wanna stress that the global opt-out preference signal is voluntary under the CPRA as approved by voters in 2020. The CPRA does not actually mandate businesses to provide a global opt-out signal. It provides businesses the option and requires regulations around that voluntary use. Subdivisions A and B of section 1798135 of the civil code gives businesses three options. A business can have one, do not sell or share my personal information link, as well as a separate limit the use of my sensitive personal information link, or they can have a single link that does both. Alternatively, the third option is to not have any links as long as they recognize an opt-out preference signal. This allows businesses the opportunity to implement the most effective method for their particular situation, while still providing individuals the opportunity to opt out of the use of their PI. Second, we strongly believe that regulations that address the requirements of this voluntary signal must be developed with industry input to prevent unworkable standards and to prevent anti-competitive impacts. We have concerns over their possibility that consumers sent over the possibility of consumers sending conflicting signals, which would create significant compliance burdens for businesses. The risk includes a scenario where a consumer uses a universal opt-out, but then opts in for a specific service. We request explicit guidance around such scenarios. Additionally, while the CPRA contains numerous helpful guidelines for issuing technical specifications for any opt-out preference signals, it's unclear to us how businesses will know which signals meet the requirements that this agency comes up with. Third, we strongly stress the need for harmonization. Consistency across state lines is critical as more and more states are issuing similar laws and regulations to adopt their own opt-out signal requirements. Harmonization ins helps ensure compliance. We suggest specifically looking at the states of Colorado and Connecticut. Similar to CPRA, Colorado requires clear communication of a consumer's affirmative, freely given, and unambiguous choice to opt out. Colorado also, however, prohibits their rules from adopting a mechanism that is a default setting, and it requires that the signal also permit the controller to accurately authenticate the consumer as a resident of the state and determine that the mechanism represents a legitimate request to opt out. We believe such elements should be considered here as well. Our fourth point revolves around how businesses process opt-out signals. As a technical matter, a business may not be able to recognize a user from a browser signal. Signals should only apply to recognize identifiable consumers in order to avoid the risk of a choice only being recognized on an individual browser. Technical standards should also ensure that the signal accurately identifies the residency of the user so the business knows that the user is exercising an opt-out choice under CPRA. 
However, businesses should not be required to identify unauthenticated users to ensure that they are opt-out of all forms of selling or sharing PI. The CPRA specifically states under subdivision J of 1798145, that the act shall not require re-identifying or otherwise linking information that in the ordinary course of business is not maintained in a manner that would be considered PI. Fifth, a global signal should also permit consumers to reverse their decision and opt back in if they so choose, both as a general matter and for specific use cases for specific businesses as well. As such, we need further clarity on how businesses can provide consumers who have previously indicated they wish to opt out via the signal with the opportunity to consent to the sale and sharing of their PI or the use and disclosure of their sensitive PI with that business specifically. The regulations could allow businesses to use a pop-up window or other form of consent for this purpose. Sixth, opt-out signals must, excuse me, uh, must not come preset with default settings and businesses must be able to have the right to notify consumers of the benefits and consequences of opting out in the use of cookies. This promotes informed choices and gives effect to the statutory requirement that the signal be sent with the consumer's consent where consent means any freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous indication of the consumer's wishes. A couple other points I'd like to make in my remaining time on the right to correct. Accurate information is in the best interest of both consumers and businesses. Companies already have existing ways to allow consumers to correct their data and shouldn't have to build new systems just for CPRA. We urge the agency to allow flexibility in how this right is effectuated, similar, for example, to how existing regulations on the CCPA's right to delete allow for flexibility when data is in backup systems. The right should be limited to correcting only that PI which is necessary for the consumer to receive services and exercise rights related to the business, such as their name, contact information, payment information. It should not extend to data points such as the consumer's IP address. Regulation should also consider uh, situations where the effort to correct may be disproportionate to the benefit to the consumer. Stated another way, efforts by businesses should be commensurate with the significance of the data's impact on the consumer. If, for example, data is no longer being used for a commercial purpose and is archived based on legal requirements, that would require significant effort to correct. Next, we strongly believe that regulations for, regulations for automated decision-making ought to be limited to fully automated processes that make, not just assist, final decisions without human intervention and that have legal or similarly significant effects on consumers, such as in the realm of housing, lending, medical benefits, and so forth, as articulated in other state laws, such as Colorado. This avoids capturing everyday low-risk automated technologies that enable businesses to serve consumers at scale, such as spreadsheets or computing software. Furthermore, we caution that any broad right, to, uh, broad right to opt out of ADM is not supported in the text of the law and could undermine an otherwise helpful process to both companies and consumers. Lastly, on cybersecurity audits and risk assessments, any audit requirements should only apply to those systems that engage in high-risk processing. 30-second warning. Reporting obligations to the agency should be clarified to reveal, uh, to avoid revealing security or other vulnerabilities could, that could result in additional risk of proprietary information if disclosed. And we also ask that the agency recognize well-accepted existing standards for cybersecurity audits, such as ISO and NIST, and allow for information security policies that align with similar industry standard frameworks. With that, thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your comment. Our next speaker will be Dan Freckling. Okay. Okay, Mr. Freckling, you have seven minutes. Your seven minutes starts now. You may use your camera if you wish. You're muted. Thank you. Hi there. I'm Dan Freckling, CEO of Boltive. Uh, We're a software company doing business in California that exposes personal data leakage. I wish to speak on the ways current technologies and methods used today routinely interfere with consumer rights to opt out. As important as it is to address dark patterns, it's just as important to address dark signals. And dark signals are consumer opt-outs that fade as they're passed to downstream parties in cross-context behavioral advertising. Consumers choose to opt out or opt in, but with dark signals, this choice is never received by those that are buying ads. Dark signals endanger consumer opt-out rights. 
Dark signals occur in real-time bidding, the process that powers cross-context behavioral advertising. It's an auction in 200 milliseconds, and it, it plays a worthy role by delivering relevant messages to consumers, but their vulnerabilities. Here's an illustration that starts with a, a mobile website here. And for opt-outs to work with real-time bidding, the website needs to communicate with the supply side platforms, the exchanges and networks, demand side platforms, all the way down to where the advertiser is. And this can involve 50 or more vendors per website. Leaks can happen anywhere at any interface between these parties. And these third parties make code changes periodically, which can cause data leakage. Critics of real-time bidding say that it passes personal information about geolocation, health, religion, sexual preference, and ethnicity. Because CPRA came about partly to restrain excesses in cross-context behavioral advertising, Boltiv recently completed a study to see how many of the Fortune 100 use opt-out technologies that are both compliant with the law and work with web, web protocols like real-time bidding. Boltiv's auditing tool creates secret shoppers to expose exactly where the leakage is. And we found two thirds of the Fortune 100 use consumer opt out methods that are either legally unapproved or cause dark signals. We classified five methods of opting out of data sharing. And our intention here is to inform, not endorse. Um, the first is industry consortia, which are used by 69 firms in the Fortune 100, web for forms that are used by 47 firms consent management platforms, 42 firms, offline methods, 11 firms, and user-enabled methods like GPC that none of the firms appear to be accepting. Firms are required, of course, under C CCPA to use two or more methods. And where, what we found where they succeed or fail, the industry consortium model, such as the Digital Advertising Alliance, the Network Advertising Initiative with 127 vendors participating is the most popular. The underlying technology works with those, those partners 98% of the time, but the consortia appear to be in question by two OAG published notices of alleged non-compliance last year. Online web forms are second most common. They have precedent since consumers use them to opt out of email communications. They are permitted by CCPA in section 135A, but they too don't integrate well with real-time bidding when not logged in, which is very rare. Further, Boltiv has found that 62% of the forms don't delete. Some are all third-party browser cookies, so personal information is still shared down the chain of vendors. Consent management platforms are the third most common. They are allowed by CCPA, but Boltiv software finds these handshakes fail 25% of the time in real-time bidding. And offline methods such as phone and email are the fourth most common. They're specifically mentioned in 11 CCR 999.315A, but they're incompatible with real-time bidding. And lastly, user-enabled methods, also called global opt-out preference signals like the GPC and the ADPC, they are efficient as Justin Brookman and Robin Berjan pointed out, but none of the Fortune 100 have adopted them based on our research. So our research shows two thirds of the Fortune 100 are not effectively handling consent and dark signals endanger consumer opt-outs. In one example, Bolta found a foreign company known for ad fraud extracting data to build profiles of consumers. In a recent example, we found advertising to manipulate public perception of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But most of the time, data leakage is unintentional. Usually companies are acting in good faith. They and their vendors, though, use opt-out methods that don't work. And we need rules to ensure opt-out methods are both legal and effective. To address this, CPPA rulemaking must ensure that dark signals do not endanger consumer opt-out rights in cross-context behavioral advertising. Clearly, the intent of CPRA goes beyond advertisers and data controllers to downstream partners and data processors, but the statute's not clear in this regard. The CPPA can clarify requirements and technical specifications for an opt-out preference signal in section 185A19A must include accurate transmission of opt-outs to all third parties in cross-context behavioral advertising. Companies should then be audited for transmission of opt-outs and action taken by parties in the advertising chain. Only then can consumers feel safe their opt-outs are not misinterpreted as opt-ins. Without this supervision, dark signals endanger consumer opt-out rights. The rules today are like delivering goods when a stranger presents a payment method, but not checking to see if the payment actually went through. 
Furthermore, the CPPA can ensure the audit authority mentioned in section 185A18 includes verifying that opt-outs are authentically passed and received by parties in the advertising chain. Now, monitoring the multitude of opt-outs by consumers may seem a tall task. Fortunately, the businesses or CPPA can use privacy-enhancing software that requires no installation. With cloud software, you can orchestrate 100% compatibility, something that both online firms and regulators may find of interest. So in closing, if rules don't require opt-out signals to function down the chain, companies may do just enough to meet the letter of the rules, leaving consumers exposed. But if CPPA rulemaking mandates that consumer choices accurately flow through vendors, similar to checking that the payment actually goes through, warning. CPRA can, through this, ensure dark signals do not endanger consumer opt-out rights. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much for your comment, Mr. Freckling. Our next commenter is going to be Margaret Gladstein. And Margaret, Margaret Gladstein will be uh, joining us via phone. Okay, Ms. Gladstein, you've been unmuted. Your time starts now, you have seven minutes. Thank you. My name is Margaret Gladstein and I'm here on behalf of the California Retailers Association. CRA is the only statewide trade association representing all segments of the retail industry, including general merchandise, department stores, online markets, restaurants, convenience and grocery stores, chain drug and specialty retailer. Retailers have a unique role in the privacy discussion because our interests are closely aligned with the interests of our customers. Our members interact with customers every day. Fortunately, we're now back to serving more people in person. If we aren't giving them what they want, from goods and services to privacy protections, they will tell us by making different choices about where they shop and what data they share or whether they share data at all. California retailers believe the regulations should respect and empower California consumers by making sure retailers are allowed to honor their specific choices. Civil Code Section 1798.135 is clear. Honoring a universal opt-out signal is optional. We encourage you to adopt regulations that do not frustrate consumer choice and recognize that when consumers have specifically made a choice, that specific choice should outweigh a general opt-out browser setting. That said, because there is, cert there is certainty, excuse me, that said, there is uncertainty right now with the universal opt-out signal because there are no guiding principles regarding its creation, implementation, universality, and the ability to ignore it when appropriate. The universal opt-out signal should not be left to the devices of any single organization to create, especially an organization that operates outside the purview of this agency. The signal should be created with the required input from industry so that no one entity exerts outsized and influence over the signal standards. This would make sure California consumers have the benefit of a regulatory system that is clearly transparent and functional for them. It would keep the number of signals to a minimum, ideally just one, so there would be no conflicts among signals. The signal needs to apply to only recognized customers and be applicable ac across browsers and devices. It should also make sure consumers retain the right to opt out, to opt in, or reverse any opt out selection. Without these requirements, the system risk, risks confounding and frustrating consumer expectations and running counter to their desires as multiple entities create differing signals. If this happens, California businesses, especially small businesses, will experience significant compliance costs. We encourage the agency to outline a clear path for consumers who previously opted out and then choose for themselves to opt in for specific business or use cases. I'd also like to briefly discuss the CPR definition of dark patterns. CRA believes this definition runs a risk of being over-inclusive because any user interface that structures a user flow experience could be interpreted as having the effect of limiting user choice to the options that are provided. Designers have to make choices in creating user experiences. Attempting to design an interface that provides a user with control over every theoretical choice that could exist would not conserve consumers and would be impractical. The agency can provide clarity by specifying the addition of dark patterns is focused on design practices that amount to consumer fraud. I would like to address one more area that can be particularly difficult for retailers if not properly dealt with by this agency. That is whether the processing of personal information in the context of employment should be covered by these regulations. 
We believe employment related information should be excluded. The risk to individuals' privacy regarding collection and processing of personal information in the context of job applicants and employment independent contractor relationships would not outweigh the benefits where the personal information is collected and used solely within the context of an individual's role or former role as a job applicant, employee, or independent contractor. Any risk to the privacy of individuals in the HR context is far outweighed by the significant confusion such regulations would create for California workers and the substantial compliance burden they would place upon businesses of all sizes, especially small businesses. Regulations about personal information or sensitive personal information would necessarily result in significant confusion and cost and conflict with the litany of state and federal employment laws governing personal information in this area. HR data should be excluded from these regulations, but if they are included, they must, one, not impose an undue burden, two, permit an opt-out process through existing ex internal HR platforms and technology, and three, not conflict with the ability to comply with state and federal laws, civil, criminal, or regulatory inquiries, investigations, subpoenas, or summons, or to exercise or defend against legal claims. The California Privacy Protection Agency has a great opportunity to create a strong privacy framework that works for consumers and businesses alike. The California Retailers Association appreciates the opportunity to make comments, and we encourage you to find balance by adopting reasonable regulation that meet consumers' privacy needs and expectations while still enabling retailers to offer the products and services consumers want. We look forward to providing our assistance to counsel in that process. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment. Our next speaker will be Stuart Ingus. Stuart Ingus, please raise your hand. We'll move on to Tom Kemp. Okay, Mr. Kemp, you may use your uh, camera if you wish. You have seven minutes to speak. Your time starts now. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, great. So, hi, I'm Tom Kemp, and uh, I am a longtime uh, cybersecurity uh, executive. I've co founded couple of companies um, and also been heavily involved uh, in the privacy world. I specifically worked on the Prop 24 campaign. Uh, and most recently, I've proposed SB 1059 to enhance the data bro broker registry law uh, that moves the registration and regulation of data brokers over to the California Privacy Protection Agency. So there's a, a couple of issues as it relates to the consumer's right to opt out uh, that I wanna discuss uh, in my seven minutes. The first issue is that consumers actually don't know their rights. Um, and so there was a recent survey done by Consumer Action and the Consumer Federation America uh, that many consumers have actually not exercised their rights under the CCPA to see and delete their personal information collected about them and to request that the information not be sold. And it turns out the top reason given for not exercising these rights was not knowing about them. So we just have a fundamental issue. If you wanna get consumers and on the topic of consumers right to opt out, uh, you need to have consumers know that they can actually do that. The next issue is that consumers are really facing a scavenger hunt when they do exercise their rights. And I know Justin with Consumer Reports talked about the survey that they did a year and a half ago, and it was painful to read in that customers struggled to locate the required links to, to stop the sale of their information. Um, some do not sell processes, um, involve multiple complicated steps to opt out. Um, and over 50% of the time, the actual consumer was somewhat dissatisfied or very dissatisfied with the opt-out process. So first of all, the first issue is people don't know they have the, this actual right. The second issue is 
is that when they do know they have the right, that they struggle to actually be able to exercise this right. The third issue is that it turns out that customers don't even know who has their data. And so there's these entities called data brokers that collect consumers' personal information and resell or share the, that information with third parties. The key definition of data brokers is not only that they sell or share to third parties, but they have an indirect relationship. And so because companies, these companies, data brokers never interact with consumers, consumers are unaware of their existence. And, and so the problem is, is that they don't know who to go to, to be able to exercise the rights. And what's frustrating is, is that Vermont first and then California implemented a law, in the case of California, AB 1202, um, that mandates the registration of data brokers. Now, take into account that there's 4,000 data brokers in the world, many estimates from organizations like EFF and EPIC and the Privacy Rights Clearinghouse um, say that they're thousands. Um, and when the law was passed, the attorney general said, hey, we expect 1,000 data brokers to actually register, which would give awareness and visibility um, to organizations uh, and, and, and consumers to know who they should contact to exercise their rights. But the problem is, is that only 400, 10% of the worldwide data brokers and 40% of the expected data brokers have actually registered. And the headlines are screaming with issues regarding phone location data, mental health apps are sucking information out and they're trading that. Um, we have a priest was even outed uh, because it tracked that person's uh, location, um, et cetera. And just the other day, a reporter was able to purchase phone location data uh, from a data broker for people coming and going from Planned Parenthoods, and they only had to pay $160. So we also, as consumers, lack visibility on who actually has our data as well. So I have three specific proposals um, on this particular topic that I want to uh, raise with the Privacy Protection Agency. Number one, is that the Privacy Protection Agency should do public service announcements to educate consumers regarding their privacy rights. Prop 24 gave a $10 million per year budget to the PPA. Because staffing is going slow and steady, and I know Ashkan and the team are, are doing a good job, it just takes time, right? I, I estimate that there's probably going to be an unused budget of this fiscal year of $7 million. And given that enforcement doesn't kick in to mid to 2023, there will probably be, it just you, just, you can't hire the people and spend the money on doing regulations. There's probably going to be an unused budget of $5 million next year. So these are just my, you know, estimates off the top of my head right here, but it's going to be over $10 million over the next two years. The PBA has the money and it should spend it on public awareness. And specifically, if you look at the requirements in Prop 24, there's a number of requirements of the PPA have to do with evangelism. Specifically, Section 1798.9940E says that the PPA shall provide guidance to consumers regarding their rights under this title. So spend this unused money because the law says you guys should be providing guidance to consumers to address that first seconds. issue. The second requirement is, is that there is a privacy interactive tool that can be enhanced that should be the call to action. And then the final thing is I definitely urge that the PPA look at data brokers. Obviously, you guys can't publicly support SB 1059, but I do think that there needs to be more sunshine and transparency with companies that we don't have a direct relationship that share and sell our data. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for your comment. Our next speaker is going to be Justin Kloxko.
Thank you, Mr. Kloxko. One moment. Okay, Mr. Kloxko, you have seven minutes. If you wish to use your cam camera, you may. Your time begins now. You're on mute. Sorry about that. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Justin Klosko with Consumer Watchdog. And uh, we are particularly concerned about precise geolocation in cars um, and anticipate the board will draw uh, strong rules to allow users to opt out of geolocation. Uh, so car data is the new gold rush of the auto industry. Um, this year, nearly all of new cars on the road will be connected, meaning they will be essentially smartphones on wheels. Um, automakers and third-party companies know where we drive, what we buy, eat, our texts down what time opened. Uh, a total consumer profile is created with this information. Uh, to, to essentially sell you things. Uh, the targeted advertising we see in our browsers, inboxes, and social media feeds is, is coming for the driver's seat. Uh, currently, uh, car infotainment systems like Chevy's OnStar services feed users data to apps like Domino's and Shell. Uh, this is according to a Washington Post investigation. Starbucks knows your geolocation, so it could know the best time to divert you through a drive through and so this kind of amounts to what has been called behavioral modification. Uh, the software company Telenave is developing in-car advertising. It's touting a freemium model similar to streaming services like Hulu and Spotify, um, where in exchange for free services, drivers will be flashed with ads. Uh, it made a post on its website um, saying uh, why in-car advertising works um, and it, Telenave's case basically amounted to quote unquote, advertising is worth it to the consumer while disregarding safety and privacy. Uh, one of these companies that sources location data with car companies is Autonomo. Uh, the company itself has said it collects 4.3 billion data points a day. And an internal company presentation says that thousands of organizations have access to Autonomo's data. And just last week, it was hit with a lawsuit in California over its geolocation tracking. Uh, so simply put, cars don't need to know your geolocation to just drive. Manufacturers argue opting out of geolocation will take away emergency services for drivers in case of an accident. Um, this is an argument presented by the Alliance for Automotive Safety. It's a car lobby whose members include Ford, GM, Toyota, and virtually every automotive manufacturer. It sued the state of California over lowering vehicle emissions, it sued the EPA in order to lower ethanol and gasoline. And it recently has fought the right to repair law that voters have passed in Massachusetts. And in its proposed rules to the board, the Alliance warned, quote, if a consumer opts out of automated decision-making that supports a car crash avoidance system, that system will no longer be allowed to help avoid or mitigate the impact of a crash. So they are, they are weaponizing safety and using the same tracking consent form for a host of other reasons. And it's a false choice. Uh, consumers don't have to choose between their safety and having their data used for other tracking purposes. This agency's rule should force manufacturers to unbundle consent for tracking for, for a paramedic from tracking for other reasons. And manufacturers are also urging the agency to not require them to provide access to personal info because in most cases, companies say they do not know who is driving a particular vehicle. But how do they not know that if they have customers consent in the first place? Uh, this commission has the power to require companies to stop the use of geolocation for anything other than what is intended for. Companies simply don't want to do it. Um, we expect the CPPA will introduce rules that require companies to limit their collection of geolocation for the intended use of safety location, not for any other use such as marketing. The danger of this type of surveillance is profound. Auto insurance companies will discriminate against people based on neighborhoods they frequent. Law enforcement agencies already have access to this data and evade traditional warrant requirements by tapping into information uploaded from the USB port. 
Companies will often say they use anonymized data when often that might not be true. Uh, anonymized data when paired with other leaks or data points such as credit card usage can be used to identify you and target you according to technologists we've interviewed and news reports. Um, a German study looked at anonymized user vehicle data found that just 15 minutes worth of data from brake pedal use could identify the right driver. Um, and a Stanford and Princeton study showed that de-anonymizing uh, user social networking data uh, was pretty, pretty simple. Um, the CPRA currently defines precise geolocation as, quote, any data that is derived from a device and that is used or intended to be used to locate a consumer within a geographic area that is equal to or less than the area of a circle with a radius of 1,850 feet. Uh, car data falls under this definition. Uh, the CPRA also recognizes that precise geolocation is a type of sensitive personal information, uh, thereby giving consumers the right to limit its use and disclosure in certain circumstances. The definition. Uh, aside from privacy concerns, distracted driving is a big concern as the industry is, clearly wants to commodify its data and advertise to you. One of the biggest misconceptions is that technology is making driving safer, um, and it just isn't. Uh, the past couple of years saw big increases in traffic fatalities, prompting the federal government to take action. And the death toll could grow if companies can increasingly turn our vehicles into vessels for consumerism. Uh, uh, and as many of you know, um, you know, we live in an area in an era of surveillance capitalism. And that's why it's important that geolocation can be addressed. Uh, people should be able to opt out of location data in cars, just like we can with our smartphones. And so uh, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your comment. Our next speaker will be Kier Lamont. Kier Lamont, please raise your hand. Okay, Mr. Lamont, you have seven minutes. Your seven minutes starts now. Thank you for the opportunity to participate. My name is Keir Lamont and I'm counsel with the Future of Privacy Forum. FPF is a consumer privacy nonprofit that provides resources and independent analysis to policymakers based on our work with privacy professionals, advocates, and scholars. I would like to direct my comments towards the consumer right to opt out of the sale and sharing of personal information under the California Privacy Rights Act, and specifically the Act's delegation of rulemaking authority regarding opt-out preference signals under CPRA Section 21A, paragraphs 19 and 20. A data protection regime rooted primarily in individual controls and consent options is, as Mr. Brookman and Mr. Kemp described, overwhelming and unmanageable for ordinary people in practice. The development of user-selected universal opt-out mechanisms expressed through browser settings, plugins, or other technologies is intended to help solve this issue by automatically conveying individual requests to invoke privacy rights to all businesses that an individual interacts with, at least within a particular medium. For example, a browser plugin is capable of sending signals to all websites that the browser visits, while a mobile device platform setting may be needed to send similar signals to apps. As a first order matter, comments from earlier speakers have shown that there are diverging views as to whether the plain language of the CPRA requires that businesses recognize qualifying opt-out preference signals. However, regardless of how this question of statutory interpretation is ultimately resolved, California has led the way on this issue by and also prompted additional states, notably Colorado and Connecticut, to include and unambiguously require the recognition of opt-out signals in forthcoming privacy laws. By virtue of its rulemaking authority, the CPPA therefore has an important opportunity to contribute to the nationwide development of bedrock technical and policy principles for preference signals. I would like to highlight three major issues for the development and implementation of signal preferences. One, 
standards are needed for responding to different requests from different tools, browsers, devices, and business-specific privacy settings. Two, uh, there are practical and policy questions for the association of an opt-out request with uh, data collected from different sources. And three, uh, there was a need to establish a forward-looking, multi-stakeholder, multi-jurisdictional process for recognizing qualifying preference signals under emerging US state laws. First, rulemaking should address what to do when a business encounters conflicting signals or signals that are inconsistent with other expressions of choice. Consumers today face an expanding labyrinth of signal choices across different platforms, technologies, and business-specific privacy settings. In this environment, there are many occasions where a business may receive signals that appear to be duplicative, differing, or in conflict with each other. Uh, for example, most individuals will visit websites through multiple browsers and devices, which may each send multiple or different opt-out signals that may be set in different configurations. Furthermore, uh, some of those websites will display cookie banners asking for consent to sell device browsing history to ad networks. Meanwhile, other websites will have authenticated relationships with users and may offer individualized privacy controls and choices, like through a privacy dashboard. In many cases, qualifying opt-out preference signals should override other settings. For example, uh, when consent comes from a cookie banner, which does not provide real and meaningful choice. Uh, this is the approach taken by lawmakers in Connecticut, which uh, in forthcoming uh, Senate Bill 6, uh, requires that businesses must respect global opt-out signals as overriding other business-specific privacy settings. With, however, an opportunity to provide users uh, with notice of the conflict to ensure that uh, consumers' true preferences are respected. However, in other cases, it may be uh, appropriate to consider an individual's separate privacy settings uh, set with a specific service or platform or written consent offered in an offline context, which uh, it may be appropriate to take precedence. Second, the agency should clarify the extent to which opt-out preference signals can be expected to and should apply to separate sets of personal data. For example, an individual might have both an online and offline relationship or account with a retailer and may occasionally visit that retailer's website without logging in. When that happens, sending an opt-out signal would be directly associated only with information from that individual's browser, encompassing an IP address, cookie IDs, and other header information. That data may or may not be readily linkable to the user's full identity or existing account with the retailer or might only be linkable uh, by taking additional identifying steps. If an opt-out preference signal sent through a browser can be reasonably linked to a person's full identity, account, or other offline information, a secondary question arises as to whether the signal request should apply to that additional information. In some cases, extending the effect of the signal to other data sets could be inconsistent with what users expect in enabling a particular plugin or other request mechanism. The answer to this question may depend in part on the disclosures that individuals receive when they select and enable a specific opt-out tool. Finally, I would like to close by emphasizing the need to establish a forward-looking process for designating opt-out signals that meet the requirements of the CPRA and future agency regulations. The current digital ecosystem features a broad array of controls and signals, none of which clearly meet the requirements specified under the CPRA. Entering the next era of US state privacy laws, new signals are likely to continue to proliferate and expand across new technologies and platforms, including in offline contexts, uh, in IoT devices, and for connected vehicles. We therefore encourage the agency to engage directly with regulators in other jurisdictions, particularly Colorado and Connecticut, to develop an authoritative, multi-stakeholder process for the designation of qualifying opt-out preference signals as they are developed and refined. 30 seconds. Consumers and businesses alike will benefit from certainty as to what preference signals meet the requirements under various state privacy laws. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your comment. Our next speaker will be David LaDuke. Mr. LaDuke, please raise your hand. Thank you.
Okay, Mr. LaDuke, you have seven minutes to speak. Your time starts now. You may speak. Good afternoon, CPPA board members and staff. My name is David LaDuke, and I'm the Vice President for Public Policy at the Network Advertising Initiative, or the NAI. The NAI is the leading self-regulatory organization for advertising technology. For over 20 years, we've promoted digital advertising by maintaining and enforcing high standards for the collection and use of consumer data among our member companies. We appreciate the opportunity to provide input prior to the rulemaking process for the CPRA. With five comprehensive state consumer privacy laws expected to become operative in the next 18 to 24 months, and many more states considering new laws, we're facing an inconsistent set of rules that are likely to confuse consumers and create a disparate set of obligations that makes compliance extremely difficult for businesses. We therefore urge you to seek a collaborative approach in developing, implementing regulations, and specifically to work with other states to harmonize the requirements to the greatest extent possible. Colorado Attorney General Phil Weiser recently uh, expressed a commitment to harmonize his state's regulations with other states. And we hope that you'll engage in a dialogue with Colorado and other states, enforcement officials to maximize consistency with respect to the implement, in, implementation of legal regulations. This coordinated approach can greatly benefit consumers in California and across the country and businesses that need to comply with disparate legal requirements. This will also be the overall benefit of the California economy and the US economy, both of which are increasingly driven by data-driven innovation. I'll be focusing my brief remarks today on CPRA's requirements around opt-out preference signals, which have been talked about extensively already. These generally refer to browser-based signals either deployed natively or through as a plugin, uh, device settings, or other mechanisms that communicate a signal uh, to a business, a consumer's choice to exercise his or her rights to opt out as provided by the CPRA and potentially and hopefully aligning with other similar state laws. The NAI has a long history of promoting consumers' ability to exercise choice over uses of their data for digital advertising. Enabling consumers to express their preferences and exercise controls through easy to use choice mechanisms is a foundational element of tailored advertising that we have championed for decades. The CPRA provides the opportunity for businesses to either provide for a direct opt-out link on their digital property or to honor automated opt-out preference signals. While the NAI members already honor this direct consumer opt-out through do not sell links, we believe that most NAI members would also honor opt-out preference signals that represent clearly expressed choice by a consumer. Broad and consistent recognition of these signals, therefore, would help to minimize confusion among consumers who deploy such mechanisms. Fortunately, the CPRA provides valuable protections to enable effective implementation of these signals, including the following. First, a consent requirement for consumers to enable opt-out preference signals. For this, the CPRA defines consent very specifically, seeking to ensure that consumers knowingly and intentionally turn on an opt-out preference signal. Two, a specific requirement for regulations to ensure that the manufacturer of a platform, browser, or device that sends an opt-out preference signal cannot unfairly disadvantage another business. And three, direction to the agency to develop regulations that provide for reconciling differing preferences expressed by the same consumer to the same business. These are three critical elements to deploying signals effectively. We urge the agency to develop regulations that elaborate on these important priorities by doing the following. First, provide a requirement that any signal activated by a consumer is clearly communicated to businesses as a consumer opt-out request, consistent with the opt-out rights established by the law. As Mr. Lamont mentioned, there are uh, dozens, if not more, signals already in the marketplace, and, and, and most of these, if not all of these, do not clearly align with the opt-outs, the legal requirements in the CPRA. In doing this, the regulation should avoid development of prescriptive technological standards, however, Instead, they should provide room for signal providers to customize their mechanism 
for the receiving businesses, providing for them to be turned on and off by consumers within a settings menu. Second, prevent unfair market disadvantages by establishing a process for opt-out signal technical, signal technical and operational specifications to be submitted for review by the agency. This process should also include ongoing review by the agency to, to periodically evaluate and test approved signals to ensure that they continue to be administered fairly. To, insist in the review, to assist in the review process, it is essential that the agency also seek input from stakeholders, particularly those businesses to which the signals are directed. And I think uh, Mr. Lamont also made a good point here regarding alignment with other states in this effort to try to uh, provide for a group process, uh, a coordinated process, and, and we think that would be a very good idea as well. The agency should refrain from seeking to promote a singular opt-out signal and instead should allow for various platforms and technology providers to develop signals that work effectively for their platforms and for their users. Third, clarify that application of choices made via the signal applies only to the browser or device from which such signal is made, or in some cases could be applied more broadly to a consumer if that consumer is known to the entity. The regulation should clarify that businesses are neither required to collect additional data from consumers to apply to, to opt out more broadly, nor require steps to tie pseudonymous identifiers to known consumers in cases where the businesses do, do not already perform such practices. 30 seconds. And fourth, the agency should clarify how a business may be able uh, able to prompt a user to disregard or override a signal. For instance, in cases where that business has obtained an opt-in consent to share the consumer's data in accordance with clear terms provided by the business to the consumer. This is increasingly a challenge as more and more publishers and advertisers are uh, engaging with their consumers and, and gaining their consent to use their data for advertising and for other purposes. In closing, thank you again for the opportunity. We appreciate it thank and look forward to engaging further. Thank you for your comment, Mr. LaDuke. Our next speaker is Chris Pedigo. Please raise your hand. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Pedigo, your time, you have seven minutes. Your time starts now. Great, thank you. Hi, my name is Chris Pedigo. I'm the Senior Vice President for Government Affairs at Digital Content Next. DCN is the only trade association that exclusively, exclusively represents publishers and focuses on the digital future for thousands of trusted news and entertainment brands. I'd like to first discuss how business practices are altered when a consumer exercises her choice to opt out. And then second, how she technically makes this choice. First, when a consumer opts out, the website or publisher cannot sell the consumer's data to a third party and should pass along this signal to any company which may have code on the app or website. So going forward, the consumer's data can only be collected and used by the publisher and its service providers. Service providers which are contractually obligated to use data only on behalf of the publisher to deliver the requested service and not for any secondary purpose. For instance, a news publisher and its service providers may use a consumer's data to remember a trusting subscriber's information or conduct analytics on the usage of the site or the app. These types of uses are clearly in line with consumer expectations. They facilitate the trusted direct relationship between the consumer and the publisher. And we were pleased that the law does not limit this direct use by the publishers. It would harm its business. With this dynamic in mind, section 1795.135F of the CPRA stipulates that any third party company which receives the opt out signal must immediately limit their use of that consumer's data to that of a service provider. We're very supportive of this provision for several reasons. It puts the onus for compliance on the company collecting data. It would be impossible for publishers to audit the data practices of all the third party companies in the ecosystem. Another reason is that this section clearly lays out what companies can and cannot do with consumer data. Thus, it avoids the need for publishers to renegotiate hundreds or even thousands of contracts. These contract negotiations can be lengthy, expensive, and they take resources away from the core business of creating news and entertainment. 
More importantly, as you can imagine, a few large tech companies could and have previously used their market dominance to negotiate special terms in an effort to avoid the impact of privacy law. In short, we believe this section of the CPRA recognizes the complex and dynamic nature of the digital ecosystem, and we urge you to rebuff any attempts to undermine it. The second point I'd like to discuss are the two methods by which consumers can opt out. One obviously is the, the do not sell button on a website. The other is to use a global privacy control, which persistently sends an opt out signal to every website, app or third party company that could potentially collect that consumer's data. The CCPA allows for authorized agents to send these kinds of opt out signals and the CPRA further clarifies this functionality. We believe global privacy controls are important because they could give consumers an easy way to opt out of web-wide tracking so they don't have to click on the do not sell button on every website or app they visit. We've seen nearly 80% of Apple users make this choice not to be tracked. By aligning with users' expectations, industry might even be able to grow consumer trust. And publishers have an opportunity to enhance their advertising options as they can target advertising based on direct subscriber relationship data, contextually, and through other forms of privacy-friendly advertising. In enhancing consumer trust and the value of direct trusted relationships, this law provides opportunity for publishers to capture some of the ad revenue growth as small businesses and large seek out new customers. We are concerned, however, that some will attempt to undermine the effectiveness of global privacy controls in several ways. Some on this call have suggested that the consumer should be required to take specific action to confirm or authenticate the signal. We believe this runs counter to the CPRA and the purpose of global privacy controls, which are meant to reduce friction and rapidly align with consumer expectations without requiring additional data or effort. We believe the CPRA allows these signals to be turned on by default, especially to the extent that the service markets itself as a privacy enhancing tool. That said, we are concerned that browser or device companies, particularly those with market power, may seek to promote their preference signals to unfairly favor their own business. In closing, as you prepare draft regulations for the CPRA, I urge you to do two things. One, ensure that global privacy controls are easy for the consumer to use. Two, I urge you to reaffirm the text of the CPRA, which stipulates that a third party must revert to the role of a service provider when a publisher or user agent communicates the consumer's opt-out signal. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today and look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment. Our next commenter will be Sebastian Zimanek. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Zeminik, you have seven minutes. You may begin now. Thank you very much. My name is Sebastian Zeminik. I'm an assistant professor of computer science at Wesleyan University. And I'm one of the initiators of global privacy control. And I will make it very brief. So I would like to make you know, four points. Um, first of all, um, I think uh, we need privacy preference signals like GPC. Um, you know, there was a study by um, Consumer Reports, um, it was mentioned here before, um, that showed that opt-out links, do not sell links, are not sufficient. They can work on individual sites, but they don't allow consumers to opt out, um, you know, broadly. It's just too many websites that users visit. Um, and the uh, solution to that is privacy preference signals at the browser level. Um, now, uh, the implementation for these privacy preference signals can be actually the same as for the do not sell links. There does not need to be any difference. So when somebody clicks on a do not sell link, that can have, from a technical perspective, the exact same result as if somebody sends a privacy preference signal. So first point, we need privacy preference signals. Um, the second point, 
um, they should be mandatory as uh, currently is um, the interpretation uh, of the rule. Um, we have seen with do not sell and uh, do not track that um, uh, voluntary um, you know, appeals here uh, did not work in the past. And so um, to give consumers a right that is really uh, effective and efficient, um, it should be mandatory. That's the third point, uh, or, or to the third point. Um, sometimes I hear that uh, privacy preference signals do not represent the uh, wishes of the user. So, um, you know, it's said, okay, it cannot be on by default because the user does not know about it. Um, and, uh, you know, we are doing research here at Resilient that actually designs interfaces and designs uh, solutions so that users can be made easily aware uh, of these signals. For example, um, there are tours uh, initially when users install a browser and um, they can uh, reference, you know, privacy preference signals like GPC. Um, and um, I would also uh, argue that um, most users are actually not aware that their data is being sold. Um, and so, um, uh, you, you know, uh, I, I would argue that most, most users do not agree actually um, with, um, with that as a default option. Now, um, uh, I, I want to address one other point that, that I sometimes hear specifically related to global privacy control as we have designed it, which is that it is related to all sites. Um, and that's not the case. So it can be sent to all sites, but it can be also sent to individual sites. And so if a user um, wishes to only send their out, opt out to certain sites, they may certainly uh, able to do so on their browser extensions um, that implement GPC um, that are doing that. Um, one other point on this, um, GPC is designed in a way that services that receive the signals do actually not need to keep track of state. So every time a website is being accessed, they will receive the GPC signal. Um, and that actually makes compliance fairly easy. They do not need to store the signal on their end. Um, so privacy preference signals can be designed in such a way that they represent the user's wishes and that you know, it is easy for sites to handle. Now, what I do think, um, and that's my fourth point, is that um, business models are, are impacted by um, uh, you know, uh, opt-outs by users. And so I think that is certainly something um, that, um, that, you know, publishers uh, and other services need to think about. Um, but whenever I go on industry conferences, um, you know, I remember one specific instance where, where I went, um, I, I feel that uh, there are many in the industry who actually understand this now and who are willing to evolve their business models. Um, you know, I remember one specific instance um, where um, a panelist uh, said, yeah, you know, if, if, you don't, uh, if you don't want to have a do not sell link on your site, uh, maybe don't sell, you know. Um, and so uh, I would encourage, uh, you know, all uh, the advertisers in the industry um, to evolve their business models um, and, uh, you know, uh, give uh, users uh, a, a choice, a true choice uh, to make uh, uh, the privacy um, choices that they would like uh, to have. Um, that said, you know, uh, I'm, I'm very happy uh, if anyone, uh, you know, needs uh, assistance, you know, technical assistance or has questions about this, uh, you know, to interact with anyone um, willing to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comment. Our next speaker and last speaker for this session is Aram zucker -Sharf. One moment.
Okay, Mr. Zucker Scharf, you have seven minutes. Your time starts now. Hello, I am Aram Zucker Scharf, lead privacy engineer for the Washington Post and senior solutions engineer for our Zeus Advertising Technology Group, which serves over 100 news sites. I also co chair the W3C's community group focused on private ad technology. Um, I led and lead the Washington Post technical work around complying with California privacy regulations. And today I'm speaking on behalf of the Washington Post. The Washington Post was able to seamlessly roll out CCPA compliance for our California customers when it became clear that the United States Privacy API or USP API as defined by the Interactive Advertising Bureau, the IIB, would become the industry standard for publishers and advertising systems. We were quick to adopt it. It is encouraging that a user with a little technical expertise can interact with and understand the output of the USP API. The idea of the technical signal, signal warrants further exploration as it could have an adverse effect on businesses. Advertising is one of the main streams of revenue at the Washington Post. In the world of digital display advertising, we count load times and the time to first ad shown in milliseconds and have found that every millisecond counts and adding extra loading time can have significant cost implications. Handling multiple technical signals, not having a single standard, and instead processing multiple such signals, any of which could be built on technology that itself introduces a delay, would be a significant burden for publishers. It would mean extra code on page, engineering hours to build and maintain that code, and depending on the shape of that technology, additional delay as we waited on a response from the system. That is why it was crucial for me to be involved with the group that created the global privacy control. So many of the potential pitfalls and problems that could come out of a technology-based control were avoided in its creation. It does not require complex negotiation with an API. It does not deliver a promise, a technical concept in JavaScript, which could cause us to anticipate a delay in response. And it does not require complex calculation or decoding. When the GPC specification was ready, it was easy and straightforward for us to implement it. The entire change that was needed to support GPC on the Washington Post was seven lines of code, less than 160 characters. I'm prepared to show the actual code we have actively on our website right now to make clear the low lift for implementation. When this code runs, it sets the response in our systems to follow the user's opt-out preference and is picked up by every relevant piece of ad and tracking technology on the page and either alters their behavior or is passed downstream the same as a manual opt-out process. The Washington Post takes these seven lines of code and has integrated them into our CCPA compliance mechanism that processes user status with the USP API. This happens on every applicable page of our website. Once this code runs and processes the signal, it is available for any other system that might need to know about a user opt-out. This setting of the USP API in this way passes the signal to all downstream providers who can then comply with it. The code easily alters the state of the, of the toggle we provide for California users. It displays that they have selected do not sell mode and makes it visible that the user has selected it. We think of it as a robot for clicking that toggle. With the GPC process, the opt-out actually occurs even faster than it would normally. Of the ways we handle compliance, GPC in our engineering experience has proven the fastest and most straightforward. We also can see the GPC HTTP header on any request where the user has it on and make a decision about how to handle it before the page even loads. Our experience shows it is important to have clear, fast, and transparent ways for a user to opt out and for a site to receive that opt out. Because the user's privacy setting and the GPC signal itself are available on every page, it can be easy to note that the user is detected, and we have a variety of options to act on that. We can restrict particular technologies, display the user's opt-out status, and make privacy-compliant ad calls as close to instantly as we can get. Our hope in speaking here is to make clear our experience implementing the California privacy law and the ease of use of the global privacy control for opt-out. As rulemaking is being considered, we think that what we have here described is the required characteristics for a technologically appropriate signal, fast, clear, and easily integratable into existing practices. We believe these processes make 
or these properties make GPC a signal in the best interest of our readers, ourselves as a publisher, and the ad technologies we collaborate with. One that can be used to understand and opt out under CPRA. And we wanted to make our experience of early adoption clear and urge continued support of this methodology. We appreciate the opportunity to speak here and are open to any questions. Um, that is the end of my comments. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment. I'd like to thank all of our presenters during this last session on consumers' rights to opt out. Um, we are now going to have a break um, before our last session, which will begin at 2.30, and that's on consumers' rights to delete, correct, and no. Uh, feel, you can feel free to either leave the video on or leave it, the conference open or to log out now and come back in when we start that session that again begins at 2.30. Thank you. It's now 2.30. I'd like to welcome you back to the California Privacy Protection Agency's May 2022 pre-rulemaking stakeholder session. I'd like to also remind you that the sessions are being recorded. Um, this session, which is on consumers' right to delete, correct, and no, uh, speakers that are scheduled for this current session should be signed into the public Zoom link using the name or pseudonym and the email they provided when they signed up to request their speaking slot. If you're participating by phone, you will have already provided your phone number that you'll be calling from so that we may call on you during the pre-appointed uh, pre speaking slot. Note that your name and phone number may be visible during the live session as well as in our subsequent recording. Speakers will be called in alphabetical order by last name during this window, and we will not be able to wait if you miss your slot. When it's your turn, our moderator will call your name and invite you to speak. If you hear your name, please raise your hand when your name is called using the raise your hand function, which can be found in the reaction feature on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our moderator will then invite you to unmute yourself and invite you to turn on your camera if you wish. You'll have seven minutes to provide your comments. In order to accommodate everyone, we will be strictly keeping time and speaking for shorter than the length of time you're allotted is just fine. When your comment is completed, the, moderate, the moderator will mute you. Please plan to focus your remarks on your main topic. However, if you'd like to say something about other topics of interest at the end of your remarks, you're welcome to do so. You're also welcome to raise your hand during the portion at the end of the day set aside for general public comment. Finally, you may also send us your comments via physical mail or email them to regulations at cppa.ca.gov by 6 p.m. tomorrow, Friday, May 6th. California law requires the CPPA to refrain from using its prestige or influence to endorse or recommend any specific product or service. Consequently, during your presentation, we ask that you also refrain from re recommending or endorsing any specific product or service. I now ask the stakeholders who have been assigned to the topic of consumers' right to delete, correct, and no, be ready to present. Please use the raise your hand function in Zoom when your name is called so that our moderator can easily see you. As noted, the moderator will call you in alphabetical order by last name. We'll now move to hear comments on the topic of consumers' right to delete, correct, and no. Ms. Hurtado, could you please call to our first speaker? Uh, the first speaker for this session is going to be Andrea Miko. One moment. Okay, Ms. Amico, you have seven minutes to speak. Your seven minutes starts now. Ms. Amico? Uh, can, am I audible? Yes. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, my name is Andrea Amico. 
I'm the founder of Privacy for Cars. We are the first and only privacy tech company dedicated to identifying and solving the growing privacy issues caused by vehicles. Uh, we've always offered tools and resources for free to consumers and will always continue to do so. Including last year, we created a subsidiary called Privacy for Cars California LLC, specifically for the purpose of filing data subject requests on behalf of Californian consumers. So the topic for today is right to delete, but for cars, I think we should really be talking about obligation to delete. And the reason is because by the time that consumers reach out to us and say, hey, I think I left my data in my car, it's too late. Uh, because to delete the data in cars, often you require physical access to the vehicle. And especially in this market where vehicles sell really fast, it's too late. Uh, this is a massive issue because more than four out of five cars in California were resold last year containing the data of the previous owners and their families, including minors, by the way. Uh, among those, we also can count some celebrities. I recently met the new owners of vehicles uh, driven by uh, residents in uh, uh, Hollywood, and uh, uh, we've been told uh, where they like to go to restaurants, what their phone numbers are, what their home address is, and the garage door codes to their mansions. This happens not only to celebrities, this happens to everybody. We don't think that's right. Uh, now, fortunately, December 9th, there's going to be the new safeguards rule, so hopefully uh, consumers ought to enjoy some safeguards, but I hope that the commission will pay attention to the issue that sometimes it's too late when data is stored in physical devices like vehicles. Um, also, we're going to be talking about obligation to know as opposed to right to know, because when we send California consumers to 40 dealerships, large, reputable, great dealerships, and they ask, hey, is the car that is drove, can it collect data? And is it true that the companies can actually sell the data to data brokers and insurance companies? Less than one in 10 dealerships said yes and yes. That is a stark comparison with last week, I was at a conference in San Diego and there was an auto executive from a bank and he was bragging how their cars can now collect 1100 data points per second from consumers. Uh, this is also a stark comparison with the fact that uh, in California last month, a, a lawsuit was filed, a class action was filed against a data broker that specializes in vehicle data called Autonomo uh, because they allegedly collect data from tens of thousands of consumers in California and millions nationwide without the proper um, uh, authorization. So what happens when consumers contact us and you know they click that button on our website and say, hey, I want to assert my right. Can you please file a data request? Here's some things I think this commission would like to hear. So very often we get boilerplate answers, uh, even from companies that typically have great posture on privacy. Um, Apple, for instance, they'll tell consumers, just go on the privacy policy and you can read about Apple CarPlay and log in on the platform and you can delete your data. But unfortunately, there's no section on Apple CarPlay. There's no section on either the privacy policy or the portal. So those consumers have no idea what data is collected from them. They have no ability to delete their data. The same thing, by the way, happens with Google. We know that Android Auto can collect more than 100 data points per second. We're still in a limbo. Like consumers cannot protect themselves. Um, other things that we see is that companies tend to keep us out of the loop. So we register our agents, customers appoint, consumers appoint us but then companies refuse to interact with us and go straight to the consumer. Uh, I'm very glad that uh, Consumer Reports filed a comment saying how this is completely deleterious. That's friction. It has the end result that most consumers drop off from the process and they cannot get their data deleted because they have to go through extra steps. They appointed us to do it. Companies refuse to do it. I think this practice should be banned. Um, we also see a lot of companies using the excuse of anonymized data to not respond. This is very common, especially with data brokers. They sit on massive troves of geolocation data. Uh, they have pins and pins and pins on people, what they're doing, detail profiles, biometrics. And then they say, well, this is not Andrea's data, so we cannot really delete your data. Um, well, our perspective is that if, if the data can be used to easily re-anonymize people, uh, for instance, we've seen the autonomous lawsuit, but you're refusing to take action to protect consumers, maybe you shouldn't have the data to that data in the first place. So uh, uh, I am super grateful to, for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I'm very passionate about the issue of privacy in vehicles. 
We think that this is a massive emergency that consumers are facing. Again, more than 2 million Californian families have their data breached every year just because they sell a car or because their vehicle is repossessed or because it's part of an accident. I hope that the commission will continue to look into this and uh, remain available to you and to anybody else who is on the line here today. We're happy to share facts and figures and studies so that policy and action can be based on facts and not just on opinions and lobbyists. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you so much for your comment, Mr. Amico. Our next commenter will be Johannes Ernst. Mr. Ernst, do you have seven minutes? Your time starts now. You may use your camera if you choose. You're muted, Mr. Ernst. Sorry. My name is uh, Johannes Ernst. I'm a uh, technologist and entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. And uh, I will share one slide here if I can. I have three points to make. Uh, number one, uh, we talk a lot about the costs that the new data rights we are having in California impose on businesses. I would like to um, mention that they also create many new business opportunities for innovative companies in California. And that is fundamentally because as personal data becomes available for more people, specifically the consumer, than, the, um, than just the company that has collected the data, um, and a new asset has become uh, available for consumers to use as they, as, as, they, as they please, and that enables more choice, more innovation, and new business models not based on surveillance. So there is an upside to data rights. Secondly, um, we have been at my company, we have been implementing open source software that can help consumers visualize and use their personal data that they have obtained under, um, under the relevant laws. And as we have done that, we have found many, many issues with the implementation of data access by various companies. Um, the, some of the, they reach from very mundane ones, uh, software bugs by somebody somewhere to something that is more systematic in terms of um, companies perhaps not being as willing to, sh to provide the data as they are supposed to be uh, under the law. And I give you a, so, uh, and we have, because for our own purposes, we have started tracking these issues uh, with an issue tracker at a, uh, at a website that is very rudimentary, but it is just there to collect them called accesstracker.org. Uh, to give you an example of what kind of issues we have been encountering, uh, a credit union, for example, um, uh, responded to a request that only one, uh, only one, the, the, the primary account owner of an account may make data access requests on anybody who's on the account. That doesn't seem to be quite right. Uh, a credit reporting agency reported that they have 13 fields containing 13 different email addresses uh, on a consumer, all of which were blanketed out with stars, uh, which doesn't seem to be right. And a mobile phone carrier um, it says, according to their uh, privacy policy, that they collect and sell uh, location data, but when the consumer, in this case, asked for the location information uh, to be provided to them, they said that they could not do so. So there is many kinds of issues on all sorts of levels, and, um, and it is really difficult to aggregate them uh, and, and see them because they only occur individually, uh, one consumer at a time, and they're attempting to exercise their rights. So uh, we would suggest that uh, you may want to consider setting up a crowdsourcing process of some kind, and maybe accesstracker.org or something like that could be the seed of that, where consumers in California that run into various issues can essentially report that that would help the companies themselves in figuring out what actually works about their processes. Uh, and it certainly would, uh, uh, would help uh, in focusing um, uh, in, uh, investigators of various kinds, including uh, your agency, to see where to look. And so finally, uh, the third uh, the point I would like to make is that um, the process, in our view, for exercising data rights, not just the right to know, but uh, the other rights as well, should be standardized and become automatable through software run by the consumer. And the reason for that one is that um, if uh, hundreds or perhaps thousands, and we don't actually know, of companies have our 
data uh, in various ways, there's no practical way for the consumer to go all, to all of them and run through a custom process uh, with each one of them. Uh, but this is something that is certainly very automatable with software. And I uh, would like to uh, point you to the data rights protocol.org uh, in case you're not aware of that yet, which is a project spearheaded by uh, Consumer Reports uh, to uh, write an API, to implement an API that uh, allows software to, um, uh, to exercise uh, donut cell as well as data access and uh, other requests. Um, and uh, these are uh, my comments. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment, Mr. Ernst. Our next commenter is Maya McKenzie. Okay. Maya McKenzie, you have seven minutes. Your time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon, Executive Director Sultani and other members of the California Privacy Protection Agency staff. My name is Maya McKenzie and I'm Technology Policy Counsel for the Entertainment Software Association, which is the trade association representing video game publishers and console makers. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Our industry has long supported um, providing parents and gamers transparency and choice about how their or their child's information is used in connection with video games. Um, it's also our intention and a strong emphasis on, we have a strong emphasis on providing and maintaining a safe online environment for all. So the ESA supports the right of consumers to correct inaccurate information. However, there must be reasonable limits on that right to protect against fraud. The correction right can be abused by bad actors to evade detection, gain unauthorized access to an account, or otherwise facilitate unlawful or malicious conduct. Um, specifically in the context of video games, a bad actor who has been banned from a game for harassing other players, for instance, or violating the game's terms of use could request the correction of their IP address, username, or other personal information, um, including substituting that information with fake data to circumvent anti-fraud, anti-cheat, and other detection systems that prevent such players from attempting to make new accounts. For this reason, we request the California Privacy Protection Agency develop regulations that prohibit fraudsters and other bad actors from attempting to use the correction right to undermine the security or integrity of the service or facilitate their unlawful and malicious conduct. Specifically, the regulations should clarify that a business may deny a correction request when it has reasonable belief that a consumer's exercise of such correction right undermines the security and integrity of the service or facilitates fraud, unlawful, or otherwise malicious conduct. We have suggested draft language in our written comments, happy to provide under separate cover. Uh, but this clarification is necessary to maintain consistency with the plain text and clear intent of the CPRA, which allows businesses to deny requests that are not verifiable and also in recognizes the need to balance the rights of consumers with the need to protect others and discourage unlawful activity. Further, this language is supported by the current CCPA regulations and commentary published by the California Attorney General when such regulations were published. And if I may, I'd like to make comments on uh, two other issues. Um, it's also important that any technical specif specifications for the voluntary opt-out preference signal are consistent with existing children's privacy laws and reliably convey a parent or user's choice. On this issue, we request that the CPRA regulations require a business to honor a preference signal for children under 13 only if such signal satisfies COPPA's standard for verifiable parental consent and that such regulations not include a technical specification to determine a consumer's age. Under COPPA, the federal children's privacy law, any business with actual knowledge that a child is under 13 
or an operator of a child directed site is required to obtain verifiable parental consent prior to the collection, use, and disclosure of such child's personal information, unless an exception applies. COPPA preempts any state action that imposes liability for commercial activities regulated by COPPA, namely obtaining verifiable parental consent, when the state law is inconsistent with the treatment of such commercial activity. And as detailed in our written comments, uh, any technical specification that signals age would contradict clear, long-established Federal Trade Commission guidance and ultimately is likely to prove too unreliable to effectively promote the CPRA's goals. Um, finally, we request that regulations clarify what constitutes dark patterns by aligning with the Federal Trade Commission's robust taxonomy of user face inter excuse me, user interface designs that the commission has deemed are unlawful as unfair or deceptive practices. Through enforcement actions and guidance, the commission has identified the following practices as unlawful. Buried language that obscures material disclosures in terms, poorly labeled hyperlinks that hide material terms from consumers, trick language that confuses consumers, and bait and switch practices. The regulations should align with such guidance and hold consent is not effective under the CPRA when businesses obtain consent using such unlawful practices. That concludes my remarks today. Thank you for your time. We're happy to continue working with the agency on these regulations. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Ms. McKenzie. Our next commenter will be Tracy Rosenberg. Tracy Rosenberg. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Rosenberg, you have seven minutes to speak. One moment. Yeah, just getting the, the controls okay. in place. Okay, uh, your seven minutes starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon, agency and executive director Sultani. My name, my name is Tracy Rosenberg. I'm speaking on behalf of two organizations, my own, which I direct, Media Alliance, which is a Northern California Democratic Communications Advocate, and also Oakland Privacy, which is a citizens coalition focused on protecting the right to privacy. Uh, I'm gonna speak uh, primarily on the section regarding right to know, right to correct, and right to delete, with a couple of additional comments at the end. Um, one of the questions that uh, the agency had asked was regarding how often a consumer may ask to correct inaccurate information. Um, our perspective on that is there's no doubt that inaccurate information increasingly presents troubling issues for consumers as computer-driven decision-making processes grow ever more ever-present in inaccurate PII, whether caused by identity theft or sloppy data collection practices can cause consumers to be punished in a variety of ways. So while we are sensitive to the fact that businesses can face some level of administrative burden, we are really reluctant to constrain the ability to have incorrect information removed on any sort of extensive basis. We wanna suggest that the agency might wanna consider the different kinds of inaccurate information that may be present and impose a specific and more liberal protocol for certain kinds of essential information relating to finances, health information, criminal, civil, legal information that can have significant impacts on consumers. Uh, there's obviously a tension between the business desire to streamline processes, but there is a fundamental right for consumers not to be denied significant life opportunities due to incorrect data about them. Um, secondly, uh, you, you asked when businesses should be exempt from requirements to provide consumers with a right to know, right to delete, or right to 
to correct under disproportionate effort or accuracy claims. Um, our position is that for consumers who are asking to correct information that is in fact not wrong, the consumer should be offered the opportunity to simply delete the information if they believe that it is in incorrect. There is for most private individuals no journalistic or public interest concern and no private person should be forced to keep information on their online profile if they don't want it there. When it comes to effort, while we're open to the ability of businesses to request extensions for particularly expansive information requests, fundamental rights that are granted to consumers under state law should not be subject to dismissal based sort of on it being a pain to, to accommodate them. The fundamental rights as declared under law are ipso facto not a disproportionate burden to businesses, or if they are, it is a disproportionate burden that the government has decided that they must bear. So we would ask you to be limited in your disproportionate effort um, exemptions. Uh, the final item was about procedures that businesses should follow to prevent fraud in the, in the correction of online information. We want to encourage encourage you to look at established processes like two-factor authentication and secret questions for consumers and want to state that, that these preferences are much more preferable than biometric identification techniques, which basically will create new and enhanced privacy risks under the slogan of verifying identity. Um, finally, we wanted to speak briefly about publicly available information uh, we are hoping that the agency will address problems or ambiguities in the exemption of publicly available information contained in the CPRA. We are concerned with the nature of a business's reasonable belief that information is lawfully available, especially as this relates to the data broker industry. We believe this can and potentially will be interpreted to mean any lack of specific information that uh, data was obtained in an illegal fashion and encourage a sort of negligent disregard for hacked or leaked information that is casually sold or shared without permission. What constitutes a business's reasonable belief that information is lawfully available? Does that have to be proactive knowledge that in fact the information is available or simply a lack of information that it is not? We believe it is contingent on the agency to more clearly define the parameters of what a reasonable belief constitutes within the current sort of data broker and data aggregation landscape. And if I have two more seconds, I will also briefly mention that we continue to have concerns about the financial incentives for surrendering privacy rights contained in the CPRA, section 1798.125, the non-discrimination clause in CPRA does continue to leave the door wide open for a two-tiered system that will inevitably over time focus data marketplaces on low-income consumers who will have to forego the economic damages of opting out. The stark reality for low income consumers is that it is unrealistic to expect them to be able to absorb the value of their data in every single business transaction they encounter in the 30 course seconds. Of, of their lives. So thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. You're very welcome. Thank you for the comment, Ms. Rosenberg. Our next and last commenter uh, will be Jacob Snow. Jacob Snow, please raise your hand. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Snow, you have seven minutes to speak. Your time starts now. Thank you and, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jacob Snow. I'm a senior staff attorney at the ACLU of Northern California. I appreciate the opportunity to comment 
And I wanna thank everyone on staff at the agency for their hard work to protect people's privacy in California and around the country. In 1972, um, California voters amended the California constitution to add an inalienable right to privacy. And the voter guide for that constitutional amendment said the following. Fundamental to our privacy is the ability to control circulation of personal information. This is essential to social relationships and personal freedom. The proliferation of government and business records over which we have no control limits our ability to control our personal lives. Often we do not know that these records even exist and we are certainly unable to determine who has access to them. Those words from the voter guide in 1972 could have been written today and they take on special resonance uh, as we see personal information increasingly being used to harm, track, hunt, watch people and surveil them. Consumer uh, rights to know what information companies hold about them is a foundational value under the CCPA and the CPRA, and it operationalizes those constitutional rights and norms that have long been a part of the legal firmament in California for decades. I hope the agency makes this lineage clear in its rulemaking and public education efforts as it begins its important work. The agency should also reflect on who the constituents of this privacy law are. Are the constituents of this law the people who are exposed to harm from the government and from companies who possess their personal information? Or are the constituents the companies themselves who are collecting and harvesting information from consumers and amassing and selling people's most sensitive information to the highest bidder? As we all know, the CPRA and the C C P CCPA, um, the CPRA amended the CCPA in 2020 to enshrine a trade secret exception in the law. Now this was the wrong decision. It placed the interests of companies in collecting and using people's information over the interests of people whose information was being used. And maintaining control over their own information on, the, uh, on those consumers' behalf is, is a foundational privacy right. It allows people to live their lives free of surveillance, to flourish in their communities, to preserve their own safety as well as their families. But trade secrets, on the other hand, are corporate assets. The CPRA made a grave mistake in prioritizing speculative corporate assets over Californians' fundamental privacy rights. And the agency can limit the damage of that mistake by promulgating regulations that ensure that trade secrecy claims are fully and robustly supported by evidence and narrowly construed. Professor Rebecca Wexler has shown us in her article, Life, Liberty, and Trade Secrets, that trade secrecy claims have been used to harm criminal defendants and to deprive them of access to information that is necessary to protect their lives and their liberty. The trade secret exception in CCCPRA only goes so far, however, and it doesn't require a trade secret exception for automated decision systems. The trade secrets exception in the CPRA only exists for verified consumer requests. And as such, if a company had to disclose information about an automated decision system for use to publicly or to an agency, no verified consumer request would be required and no trade secret, trade secret exception would apply. But I encourage the agency, agency to risk, resist carve outs that allow businesses to hold back information by claiming trade secrets, proprietary information, or that information is subject to non-disclosure agreements between parties and therefore cannot be shared with consumers. One goal of automated decision-making uh, regulation should be to improve the understanding that people have who are directly affected by the decisions that are made. But it's not enough to think merely about an individual consumer. There's a collective societal interest in understanding how companies are making important decisions about people and ensuring fairness in those decisions, especially given the well-documented discrimination that grows in algorithmic darkness. Companies should not be allowed to escape scrutiny by claiming the commercial need to protect their intellectual property or other company information. I'd also like to make a statement about um, the agency's position on a federal uh, privacy law, in particular preemption in a federal privacy law. The agency should come out with a strong statement opposing any preemption in a federal privacy law. From net neutrality to police violence, it is foundational to our democracy that states, counties, and cities have the ability to listen to their residents and make policy changes that can protect the communities that they represent. A federal law wiping out state protections would be a bad deal for consumers. It would put existing consumer protections, many of which are state-led and many of which exist under California law today, on the chopping block. It would leave states bound by a federal law that could prevent additional consumer privacy protections from ever seeing the light of day. Consumer privacy law in California will only get stronger over time. And those improvements, which may be years or decades in the future, should be guarded by this agency. State regulators could lose the authority to fine or sue companies that violate their laws. And all of the work of this agency for making privacy choices easier for consumers 
to building a robust enforcement apparatus that can do its job of enforcing a law on behalf of 39 million Californians could all be wasted. I appreciate the opportunity to comment. I look forward to continuing the work with the agency of protecting California's privacy in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was our last speaker for the consumer's right to delete, correct, and no session. We'd like to thank all of those who presented during this session. We're going to take a break now until our next session begins at four o'clock. That is the general public comment session. Um, and we'll be back um, in just a little under an hour at four o'clock to begin that session. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's now four o'clock and I would like to welcome you to the general public comments session of the California Privacy Protection Agency's May 2022 pre-rulemaking stakeholder session. Again, I'd like to remind you that our sessions are being recorded. Speakers who wish to speak during this public comment period should raise their hand using the raise your hand function, which can be found in the reaction feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. They will be called on in order that they appear. When it is your turn, the moderator will invite you to unmute yourself, and if you wish, turn on your camera. And then you will have three minutes to provide your comments. In order to accommodate everyone, we will be strictly keeping time. When your comment is completed, the moderator will mute you. Please note that your name and possibly your phone number may be visible to the public during the live session and our subsequent recording. If you prefer, you may also send us your comments via physical mail or email them to regulations at cppa.ca.gov by 6 p.m. tomorrow, Friday, May 6. Note that California law requires that the CPPA refrain from using its prestige or influence to endorse or recommend any specific product or service. Consequently, during your presentation, we ask that you also refrain from recommending or endorsing any specific product or service. We will now move to that public, general public comment session. Please raise your hand if you would like to speak. Ms. Hurtado, would you please call the first speaker? There are no hands raised at this time. If you wish to make a comment, please raise your hand so I can uh, prepare you to speak. Okay. Okay, we have one speaker, Kieran Gopinath. You have three minutes. You may use your camera if you wish. Your time starts now. Uh, hi, Brian. Um, thanks for uh, the introduction. Um, I have a question that uh, I've been wanting to ask. Uh, it's about the um, methodology to um, value data 
when uh, deciding on incentives for users. Now, the CCPA has uh, certain guidelines, uh, but of course, the um, methodology of valuing the data uh, could be uh, any number of ways. Uh, and I was wondering if the CPPA has uh, any point of view on the methodology uh, of uh, approach on uh, valuing the data for this purpose. Well, at this point in time, the session is about us receiving information. So if you have something that you'd like to suggest to us, um, please feel free to send that comment to us at the email address that I provided earlier. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, could you provide the email address again, please? Yes, it's regulations at cppa.ca.gov. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. If there's anyone else that wishes to make a comment, please raise your hand at this time. We're going to wait a few minutes to see if there's anyone that would like to speak um, and raise their hand, but we would encourage you if you have any general comments on anything that um, deals with the regulations that we're contemplating, please feel free to raise your hand and we will call on you. Thank you. Oh, we have another hand raised. Alistair McTaggart. Okay, Mr. McTaggart, you have three minutes. Your time starts now. Thank you. I would like to, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to address uh, the panel. I, I would like to uh, just talk about uh, some of the notions I've talked about that say that uh, CPR makes responding to the opt-out signal optional. Now, um, I negotiated with the, with the Chamber of Commerce and what they're saying is just not true. The process flow says 135A says you have to have the do not sell button on your home pages. And please bear in mind, it says home pages, not one. It's all pages that collect your information. You have to have the do not sell or share button. Um, however, 135B says, okay, if you don't want to have that button because you reputationally don't want to tell everybody in the world that you're selling their information um, or you don't want to give up the real estate, then you can go 135B. 135B says, um, if you always respond to a consumer's opt-out request, always, and the same way as if they didn't have the opt-out request, so as if they were selling your, if you were selling your information, it can't be any hurdles. So the consumer who shows up with the do not sell enabled, if you're going 135B, you can't you can't do anything. You can't diminish their service. You can't charge them more. That's why we reference 185.820 to talk about that. And then 135B1 says, look, it's the platform technology or mechanism that does this. This is your, your privacy setting. This is your, this is your phone setting. This is your, 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 your browser setting. Um, and that's what responding is. And so then you know 135B2 says the opt back in. And B3 is the, is the choosing between A and B. But then just to kind of reaffirm it, 135E clarifies that the consumer can use their browser or phone because it references the consumer authorizing another person. Person is defined as business and any kind of business. And, and, and so I get to use Apple to do my opting out for me. And um, Apple's device, my phone, can do my opting out for me. So just to clarify, just to kind of, you know, I, I know I'm rushing through this, but I just want to make very clear. As a, as a consumer, you either are going to be facing the do not sell button under, under 135A, or B, all your requests, which can be your phone or your browser, um, are met kind of seamlessly. And you don't even, you, there's nothing to indicate to, to you that the business 
uh, has ceased selling your information, but the business has to cease selling your information. So the business doesn't have any optionality. Their only choice is, do I want to have the do not sell button and be able to respond and charge the consumer more? Or do I want to not have the do not sell button? But then if the consumer shows up in the do not track world, 30 you know, seconds. Sell, uh, then you have to respect that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. We'll remain open for a few more minutes to see if there are any other people who would like to provide general comments right now. There are no other hands raised at this time. Let's just wait for about another five minutes or so. Seeing no more hands raised, I want to thank all of the presenters who provided comments today. I really appreciate your input. Um, our session will begin again tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Um, uh, using the same Zoom link. Um, the, the sessions have been recorded and they will be available on our website as soon as we have them processed. Um, I'd like to also remind you that if you miss the opportunity to provide general public comments this afternoon, not to worry. There will be another general public comment session at the end of our, our scheduled comment sessions tomorrow afternoon. Um, again, as I remind you, uh, we've approximated the times for each one of the sessions. So, so, you know, times, whether sessions go longer or shorter, it will depend, but we encourage you, if you do have some general public comments, uh, please take advantage of it tomorrow at the end of our sessions. Uh, we appreciate all of your attention today, and um, we'll see you again tomorrow morning at 9. Thank you.